in our discussion of last week, we saw why rationality is the foremost virtue of a code of ethics which holds man's life as its standard. Why, since man's basic tool of survival is his mind, is his reason, since his life and well-being depend upon perceiving and identifying the facts of reality correctly and of acting accordingly, thinking is the basic virtue that man can practice, the virtue at the root of any other virtue. And conversely, his cardinal and basic vice is evasion, blanking out the willful suspension of consciousness, the refusal to see or to judge or to know. Now then, this evening I shall proceed to a discussion of some of the other virtues, the other basic principles of action required by a morality of life. I shall be concerned to elaborate the meaning of these principles of action and to show how they relate to the matter of survival. And the first of the virtues I shall discuss in this connection is the virtue of independence. Let me begin by quoting a brief paragraph from Galt's speech. Quote, independence is the recognition of the fact that yours is the responsibility of judgment and nothing can help you escape it. That no substitute can do your thinking as no pinch hitter can live your life. That the vilest form of self-abasement and self-destruction is the subordination of your mind to the mind of another. The acceptance of an authority over your brain the acceptance of his assertions as facts, his say-so as truth, his edicts as middleman between your consciousness and your existence." Close quote. Strictly speaking, if one understands why rationality is man's cardinal virtue, it is something of a redundancy to add that man should be independent, that is, it is a redundancy to state that man should reason independently, since to reason dependently would be a contradiction in terms. Either man reasons or he doesn't reason. Either he is concerned with the correct cognition of reality or he is not. Either he seeks authentically to know and to understand, or he does not. In a word, either he thinks or he does not. A default on the virtue of independence can only be a default on the act of thinking and judging. The independent man is the man who assumes the responsibility of judging of passing judgment on what is true or false, right or wrong. Feelings, wishes, hopes, evasions are not substitutes for judgment. When they are treated as tools of cognition, then they represent the attempt to escape rational judgment. There are no independent feelings or independent evasions. To substitute an emotion or an evasion for a thought is to renounce one's independence. It's important to stress this in every possible way because some people have the totally fallacious notion that independence means acting on your quote own feelings close quote it means nothing of the kind the man who blanks out who doesn't exercise rational judgment 
and who is run by his feelings has to, a good deal of the time, function as a parasite on the thinking of others because no person is so blind as to literally believe that he can deal in reality guided only by his feelings. So that if he doesn't choose to accept the responsibility of thinking, a good deal of the time he is riding on the thinking or on the mistakes of others. He is an intellectual dependent. The intellectual dependent is the man who asks not what is true, but rather what do others think is true? What do others say is true? And making his mind subservient to the minds of others, accepts their pronouncements, their assertions, their say-so on faith. That is, without an act of independent critical judgment. If a man accepts an idea which he did not originate because he has understood it and by his own rational judgment is convinced that it is true, this does not make him a dependent. This does not make him a parasite. The fact that you learn from other men and are not the originator of every idea you hold does certainly not make you a dependent. One of the attributes that distinguishes man from the animals is precisely his power to transmit knowledge so that the intellectual achievements of the past do not die with the men of the past. Necessarily, we all gain a great part of our intellectual possessions, so to speak, from other men. But there is a very real sense in which each man, if he is to be independent, must face existence as if he were alone. As if he were the first and only man on earth. Whether a new idea is the product of his own mind or of the mind of another man, he must consider that idea as if no mind had ever considered it before, as if no one had ever said it's true or it's false, as if he is alone to grasp it, to judge it, and to decide it's truth or falsehood validity or infinity. The ideas of others can properly be used only as the material for one's thought, as that about which one thinks, among other things. But the evaluations of other men must not be a substitute for one's own evaluation for one's own judgment. The independent man accepts as true those ideas and only those ideas which he has understood, which his own mind has grasped and judged as true. He accepts only that which makes first-hand sense to him. Now here again, a certain aside is necessary. I say that an independent man accepts only that which makes sense to him. This doesn't mean that if you hear an argument, which in fact is irrefutable, you are spared the necessity of ever committing yourself one way or the other by simply saying, well, uh, this doesn't make sense to me. I'm not convinced. You haven't persuaded me. If a person gives you an argument, and if you're not persuaded, or if there's something you don't understand, you have to know what and why.
You may want time to think it over if you can't immediately say why you don't agree with it. But you cannot permit yourself forever to evade the responsibility of passing judgments by simply saying, well, uh, I don't know, I'm not convinced, period. Before a man accepts any idea, he must identify and grasp those facts and concepts from which the idea is derived. That is, he should be able to prove the idea. To do less is to take the idea on faith. The dependent man absorbs and retains only the conclusions of another's thinking, not the reasons which validate those conclusions. The mark of the independent man is that he grasps not merely conclusions, but conclusions and their proofs as well. If a man simply memorizes conclusions which he doesn't authentically understand, he will not know how to use those ideas productively or creatively. He may be able to repeat them by rote, he may be able to sling formulae, he will not know how to think with the ideas if he doesn't understand the concepts that validate them, the facts of reality from which they were derived. And in this connection, I am reminded of a man I knew some years ago who uh, was studying objectivism. This was before the founding of NBI. And I noticed that while he was a quite intelligent person, he showed remarkably little ability, puzzlingly little ability at the art of thinking creatively or productively with objectivist ideas. And in the course of a conversation one day, I learned that he, in effect, was functioning on the following kind of policy. Once upon a time, either Ayn Rand or Nathaniel Brandon had discussed various aspects of the philosophy with him. He had asked them questions, he had heard their arguments and their reasoning, and at the time he was satisfied that their reasoning was valid and made sense. Having satisfied himself that the reasoning was valid, he decided that it was now necessary only that he retain the conclusions of the discussion, secure in the knowledge that the proof was, after all, safely in reality, locked up, so to speak, or deposited inside the vault of Miss Rand's and Mr. Brandon's head, like a filing cabinet where you keep records that you don't want to clutter up your desk with, where you cannot treat ideas that way expect them to do you much good. You cannot delegate to somebody else the job of knowing the proofs of your convictions. You see, the more obvious kind of mistake is the person who simply accepts something on faith from the beginning because it feels right or it emotionally appeals to him. But the subtler form of error is the person who exercises judgment when he is first hearing the case. He doesn't accept it on faith originally, but once he's satisfied that the arguments make sense, he then proceeds to forget them. He knows they're there. He can always get them out of his files. That is, pick up the telephone and ask Rand or Brandon. He knows the answers exist, he's seen them. So now all he needs is the conclusions. But that's not true. If you want to think productively with ideas, you have to know their proofs, you have to know how one concept relates to another, how they are derived, how they are structurally organized. Otherwise, it isn't knowledge that you possess. A man is safer when he makes an error through his own judgment 
than when he blindly and uncritically accepts the correct judgment of others. If he does judge, does think, but makes an honest mistake, then he may have to pay the consequences of his error in action, but he still has retained the means, the method, of correcting his error and arriving at truth. But the dependent is not only unable to apply his memorized formulae successfully in any situation which is the least bit subtle, he is pursuing a course that renders him unable to distinguish A common fallacy concerning the actual nature of independence is often expressed in some such statement as this. No one can be fully independent because we all have to rely on experts in fields of knowledge outside our own. If you are sick and the doctor tells you that you need an operation, don't you have to take his word for it? Let's consider the confusion and the fallacy involved here. A man, to begin with, does not have to be omniscient or a universal scholar in order to know what he is doing. He needs only to know very clearly what are his grounds for any given decision and that they are sufficient and rational. We all must, at times, make decisions without full knowledge, act without full certainty. We must all take the calculated risk of trusting the competence of a specialist in some field of endeavor. But a calculated risk is rationally justified only if it is a calculated risk and not a blind leap in the dark. It is not, for example, it is not a rationally calculated risk to walk into the office of the first doctor who shingle one happens to see, knowing nothing about the man's qualifications or past record, and then agree to have him take out the appendix one could have sworn was removed years ago. Rationality and independence require, when one is dealing with an expert, that one have a first-hand reason for confidence in the competence of that expert. It requires further that one never cease to judge what the expert is saying and doing. If, for instance, your doctor prescribes a medicine that makes you progressively more and more ill, you do not continue to go to him on the grounds that since he is an expert, he must know what he is doing, despite the fact that you were healthier before he began treating you. You don't, or shouldn't, suspend judgment merely because you go to someone seeking services in a field where presumably he knows more than you do. I can think of a personal example where several years ago, I was having some trouble with my eyes and I went to a very highly recommended ophthalmologist and he gave an explanation of what the problem was, only I tried to follow his advice and something about it didn't make sense. I didn't have a great deal of confidence in him in spite of the recommendations I had heard and I went to a different ophthalmologist just to check up and got quite a different interpretation of what the problem was which proved to be correct because the problem was resolved immediately. Another example familiar to many of us who drive cars is the following. Suppose that something is wrong with the car and you're not a mechanic. I don't think anybody on earth knows less about automobiles than I do. Not very many people anyway. And uh, peculiar noises come from the car you have to take it in for a checkup. Well, now, if you go to a garage station, every time you wander in there, 
you're informed that something incredible <laughs> is wrong, you get suspicious, don't you? And you think perhaps uh, this uh, garage operator is uh, being less than altogether candid in his diagnosis. So you shop around until you find the station who, by their general manner of dealing with you, gives you the impression that they are reliable and don't invent imaginary troubles. But even then, even then, and this is a very important point, even if I decide to take the mechanic's word for it, which I may do, deciding I have reason to do so, that doesn't mean that I know he is right. If, for example, there is some weird or unpleasant noise or unpleasant odor coming from my car, and he tells me that it's such and such, and I say, fine, go fix it up, and I come back the next day to get the car and the trouble is gone, that doesn't mean I know for a fact that the trouble was what he said it was. Conceivably, he could have erred too, or didn't tell me the truth. The point is that there are times when we have to act knowing that we don't know for sure, but knowing that there are grounds to warrant us taking the action anyway. And such decisions are forced upon us all of the time. We don't always act with full knowledge. A great deal of the time we act with far less than full knowledge. But we do have to know what we know. We have to know why we are doing what we are doing. And if we are taking a calculated risk, we have to know why we consider it justifiable to do so. But you cannot accept an idea as true you cannot accept it as your knowledge unless you know why it is true. Thus, you may be willing to accept the statements of a doctor as probably true if you have first-hand knowledge of his reliability. You may be willing, justifiably willing, to act on his advice. But if you do not know medicine, you do not literally know that his statements are true. You must always, therefore, distinguish between that which you actually know and that which you have reason, good reason perhaps, to assume is true and are willing to act on, but which you do not literally and actually know to be true. There is one field in which every one of you must in a crucial sense, be an expert, and that is the field of philosophy. I do not mean by this that each of you must be a professional academic philosopher. I do not mean that you have to involve yourself with the more technical aspects of philosophy, if that's not your interest. I mean that on the broader, more fundamental level, everyone does have a philosophy of life, and he should know firsthand why he believes what he believes. He must have reasons for his convictions. He should know the basis of his own premises. He cannot act and live his life on the advice of a professional philosopher in the same sense that, in a limited sense, he can take the advice of a doctor. The reason for this is that philosophy, and particularly morality, involve and dominate every aspect of human existence. It isn't a specialty like medicine. Moreover, the facts with which a philosopher deals are equally available to everyone. They're not the specialized kind of facts that a scientist deals with. An individual can learn from a professional philosopher, but he cannot say, as he might say about a doctor, since the philosopher appears competent, I'll take his word for it, I'll live according to his principles, I don't have time to think about those questions on my own. You cannot leave to anyone else the job of running your life. You have to know the reasons for the ideas by which you live. 
Now the primary meaning of independence as a virtue is a psychoepistemological meaning, as you can see. It pertains to the action and function of your consciousness. It pertains to how your consciousness functions. To the issue of whether or not you seek to know for yourself or blindly follow the authority of others. Whether you judge or unthinkingly agree, submit and obey. It's a psychoepistemological issue. But there are certain related senses in which it is relevant to talk about the virtue of independence, which have relevance in an ethical discussion. You will sometimes hear an extremely irrational statement to the following effect. It's nonsense to talk about independence. No one is independent. Everyone depends on everyone else. Aren't you dependent on the grocer from whom you buy your bread and meat? Well, here, of course, it is economic independence that is being discussed. The purpose of such an argument is to make you lose the concept of the difference between a relationship of trade among men who exchange value equivalents and the relationship of parasitism where one man gets an unearned support from another. If you pay the grocer for what you get, your relationship is one of independent equals. Independence does not require that you live on the self-sustaining farm. In the material or economic sphere, it merely requires that you produce the value equivalent of what you consume. Now there is one other aspect worth commenting on, and that is the issue of your moral independence of the actions of other men. No one's actions but your own can ever constitute a moral reflection on you. Very often, unfortunately, a person will mistakenly feel morally guilty for some irrationality or immorality committed by some other member of his family. But there can be no moral responsibility where there is no freedom of choice. And the only actions over which you have the power of choice are, of course, your own. You cannot be guilty because of anyone else's immoral actions unless you sanction those immoral actions. And then what you are guilty of is not the other person's actions, but your own action, that of sanctioning his actions. There is no way for a man to possess self-esteem, no way to hold the inner certainty of his competence to deal with reality if he does not practice the virtue of independence, if he does not assume the responsibility of independent judgment. For the very simple reason that a man cannot be convinced of the efficacy or the competence or the rightness of his mind and of its method of functioning if his characteristic method is to suspend his mind in blind obedience or agreement to the assertions of others. Now let us turn to another cardinal virtue of the objectivist ethics, that of integrity. If rationality and independence demand that you think, the virtue of integrity demands that you remain loyal to your thinking in action, which means it demands that you not betray the judgment of your own mind. To practice integrity means to be integrated, to allow no split between theory and practice. 
no split between one's convictions and one's actions. Now, according to the conventional altruist view of morality, integrity is a virtue because, as they see it, it requires the sacrifice of one's self-interest to one's moral principles. This view, of course, rests on a prior premise, the premise that one's moral convictions have nothing to do with one's self-interest, or with reality, or with reason, and that one's practical self-interest would lie in acting contrary to one's moral convictions. It rests on the premise that the good in theory is the destructive in practice, that man's mind and body are two warring elements, that his spirit requires that which would make his physical survival and well-being impossible. It assumes a split between the moral and the practical. But if reason, not faith, is the standard by which one forms one's concepts of good and evil, then there is no split between theory and practice, between the moral and the practical. The rational and the moral is that which serves man's self-interest and his survival and well-being on earth, serves it objectively and in fact. If one's convictions are rational, then integrity, meaning loyalty to one's judgment, to one's mind, to one's convictions, is a practical necessity of human survival. The meaning of integrity as applied to consciousness is confidence, the knowledge that the judgment of one's mind is valid. The meaning of integrity as applied to action is courage, the knowledge that to act on the judgment of one's mind is practical. If life on earth is the standard, then to quote Galt, quote, courage and confidence are practical necessities. Courage is the practical form of being true to existence, of being true to truth, and confidence is the practical form of being true to one's own consciousness, close quote. To remind you of a little story which Mrs. Brandon tells in her biographical study of Miss Rand in our book, Who is Ayn Rand? At a time when it was professionally dangerous to do so, Miss Rand, then working in Hollywood, was very outspoken in her public condemnation of communists in the movie industry. And there was a lot of pressure brought to bear, generally speaking, against people who spoke up in this manner on the part of the studios because they didn't want the bad publicity reflecting on Hollywood. When some of her conservative acquaintances complimented her on her courage, Miss Rand answered, I'm not brave enough to be a coward. I see the consequences too clearly. To sacrifice one's convictions to the wishes of other men is an act of self-renunciation and self-destruction, and that's both impractical and immoral. If, for example, you know that individualism and capitalism are good because they make human survival possible, but you pretend to be sympathetic to or tolerant of collectivism because it is popular, you betray your own consciousness, you betray your own judgment and support that which you know to be evil. You are not acting practically, you are paving the way for your own destruction and you will have deserved it. If you are an atheist who pretends to believe in God or perhaps to be only an agnostic because your relatives and friends are religious, if you betray your own judgment in order to cater to that which you know to be irrational, you will despise yourself and you will deserve it. If in your work you hold high standards which you betray in order to gain the approval of men whose judgment you don't respect, 
You will destroy any pleasure your work could give you. You will undercut and invalidate the motive that had made you choose your work. You will perceive every compliment and every success as a reproach and a source of guilt. And you will be right. Integrity requires of men, among other things, that they assume responsibility for the consequences of their own chosen actions. And this, of course, implies the previous responsibility that when they act, they should be concerned to know what will be the consequences of their actions. To accept responsibility for your actions isn't a duty you owe to others isn't something imposed on you from above. It's logically required by the principle of loyalty to your own values and to the principle that you don't attempt to defy the facts of reality or to go outside reality or to place your desires beyond the reach of reality. If you want a certain kind of career, then you have the moral responsibility to work to achieve it. If you choose to have children, then you have the moral responsibility to support and educate them. But there can be no unchosen duties and no duties which demand the sacrifice of your rational self-interest. The man who would protest that it is not to his self-interest to assume responsibility for the consequences of his actions is announcing that he intends to perform irrational actions. But that isn't to his self-interest. You see, and this is a very important Objectivism would never see integrity as some sort of self-sacrifice or resisting of temptation. But if a morality is placed in opposition to human nature and to life on earth, men will necessarily see integrity in terms of self-sacrifice and the struggle with temptation. They'll have to struggle against the sin of wanting to live and to be happy. A rational code of values teaches man that evil means pain and destruction, and that isn't a temptation. One of the simplest and yet most eloquent ways to understand the difference between our approach to this issue, our perspective, and the perspective of conventional morality and an eloquent proof of the bankruptcy of conventional morality may be observed at any magazine stand. You all know the popularity of the brightly colored magazines with pictures of beautiful girls and promises of the forbidden pleasure well, very significantly and very typically, one such magazine is, or rather was, because I think it's now going out of business, called Satan. I don't think it's around anymore. Well, pause on the implications of this. Here you're offered a magazine with beautiful girls in it, some kind of humor or assumedly, presumably entertainment, a value, and it's called Satan. Well, imagine the following. If you walked into a store in Atlantis, do you think that you'd be offered this kind of a magazine furtively under the counter 
entitled, entitled Wesley Mouch. Do you think that you would see something intended to be attractive to you, something offering you pleasure, excitement, glamour, romance, entitled Wesley Mouch? That's the difference between the conventional view of good and evil and ours. We'll take a break here for 10 minutes before continuing. Now to continue our discussion. The essence of independence is, my mind is the only judge of reality. The essence of integrity is, I hold a judgment of my mind above all else. The essence of honesty is, I do not sacrifice my mind's judgment of reality for the sake of an illusion in the minds of others. If rationality consists of the recognition that existence exists, honesty consists of the recognition that only existence exists. That, quoting Galt, the unreal is unreal and can have no value. All acts of dishonesty, lying, cheating, fraud, are an attempt to obtain some value by means of faking reality. To obtain some value which, in fact, one has not earned and cannot justifiably claim. This is obvious in the case of financial fraud, but many people who are honest in financial matters do not hold the same standard in spiritual or intellectual matters and do not hesitate to seek values by fraudulent means. Yet the principle is the same. If you gain love by faking your own character, by pretending to possess virtues which you do not possess, it is not you who are loved, but a fraudulent image which you have created in the mind of another person, and which in fact has no reality, no separate reality. If you gain fame, admiration, prestige for achievements which are not your own, like Peter Keating, or for faked achievements which do not exist at all, like a scientist who falsifies scientific data, or for achievements which you, by your own standards, do not regard as values, like any so-called box office chaser, in all such cases, the fame, admiration, or prestige are not real. They are merely an illusion, a false appraisal in the minds of other people. You wouldn't envy a paranoic with delusions of grandeur who imagines himself to be a great man. And yet the existence to which you condemn yourself if you seek values by fraud is, in a sense, more unreal than his. He at least enjoys his own first-hand delusion, if you can call it enjoyment, while what you get is only a public delusion, second-hand. And the more you attempt to enjoy it, the worse your inner torture of fear, guilt, self-loathing. You are a great man in all eyes but your own, and that fake greatness for you works as a constant reminder of your own mediocrity, impotence, unworthiness. This is the penalty for that abject self-abasement which is implicit in the formula of every liar. Only I will know. Identify what that means. Only my mind will know the time of fraud. And of what importance is my mind? Only my judgment will call me a scoundrel. And what do I care about my judgment? 
My own knowledge, judgment, perception, evaluation are the most negligible of all and the most dispensable. Why should I consider the opinion of so insignificant a person as me? Is it any wonder that men who act on that formula are never able to achieve happiness, security, self-confidence, or self-esteem? Consider the monumental insult which a man pays to himself when he decides to fake his character or his actions in order to invoke a delusion in somebody else's consciousness and to live with the inner knowledge of what his own state is. If such a man then runs to a psychiatrist moaning that he has no sense of personal identity and that he can't stand his chronic feeling of dissociation from existence, well, what identity and what sense of reality did he expect to possess after a lifetime spent on faking both? Such is the fate of men who choose lies and fraud as their basic policy or dominant policy for dealing with existence. But the majority of men who don't go that far, who practice a kind of mixed economy of the spirit, being neither hopelessly dishonest nor fully honest, do not escape the same fate and the same penalty. It's merely a matter of degree. The small lies, the petty cheating, the shabby little deceits for insignificant gains, which most men practice and forget in the course of their lives, which they drop like mere counterfeit pennies, not dollars, along their road, are never really left behind. The merciless computer of their subconscious registers and adds them up these men stop one day, feeling inexplicably impoverished, wondering who has depreciated their spiritual currency, unable to recall the steps or the occasions, knowing only that their self-esteem feels worn, frayed, eaten through. The self-esteem destroying essence of dishonesty is that you place another person or persons higher than reality in your scale of values. It is hard to tell which is worse. To lie to men whom you consider your superiors in order to gain some faked virtue, or to lie to men whom you consider your inferiors in order to avoid trouble. This last is probably more prevalent and, in a sense, uglier. If you tell lies to your relatives or chance acquaintances whose opinion you do not respect, if you consider them stupid or unable to understand you and therefore you choose lying as an easier course, you have nothing to gain by it. Your actions are non-venal, which makes it worse for your self-esteem. You sell out too cheaply. You give up the reality of your own existence. You betray your values, surrender your convictions for the sake of people you despise. What does this imply about your estimate of yourself? The terrible contradiction that a liar has to live with is the fact that he becomes the slave of his victims not the slave of their virtues, but of their weaknesses, vices, and flaws. Because in order to maintain his deceit, he has to count on their blindness, their unintelligence, their evasions, their irrationality. And he has to dread their perceptiveness, intelligence, reason. Thus he has to run from the virtues of others and to seek out their flaws. He has to value that which is a defect in others and fear that which is good. For instance, suppose a scientist becomes famous for some discovery which he claimed by falsifying scientific data. 
Thereafter, it is the best scientists whom he has to dread. He might enjoy discussions with the rank and file whom he can hope to fool, but an invitation to discuss his work with the best minds of his profession would throw him into an anxiety attack. If his ablest colleagues, whose recognition he had desperately wanted, show interest in him and seek him out, he has to try to avoid them. Any perceptive question from anyone, any sign of serious interest in his work, becomes a sign of danger. So he has to gravitate toward the more prejudiced, the less critical people around him, the less severe, the less demanding less conscientious in order to be safe. He has to run from intelligence and honesty because now it's only their opposites with whom he can feel secure. Lying or fraud is existentially impractical and achieves the opposite of the liar's intended goal. And no man of self-esteem would subject himself to the humiliation of sacrificing his own truth and his own reality to the blindness of others. There are perhaps more misapprehensions about the virtue of honesty than about any other virtue. Honesty does not mean that you owe an answer to any idle or impertinent question anyone chooses to ask you. You do not owe information to those who have no right, purpose, or business to question you about matters which do not affect them. In such cases, honesty consists of refusing to answer, not of lying. In such cases, you may point out, if you care to, that their question is improper. But you don't lower yourself to the status of a liar for the sake of their impropriety. Nor does honesty demand that you become what may be called an aggressive truth-teller, who volunteers his unsolicited, unflattering opinion to anyone on any subject justifying himself in the name of honesty. We all know there is that type also. In situations which do not concern you, or in situations which were not created by your choice and action, but which are imposed on you by others, the moral alternative is not to tell the truth or to lie, but to tell the truth or nothing. This does not mean that one may keep silent in situations where one's silence implies a lie or a sanction of evil. For instance, you do not keep silent if you hear your values being attacked at a gathering where your silence may be construed as agreement. You do not have to argue if you do not consider the people worth enlightening, but you should state, as a minimum, I do not agree with you. One must always judge the full context of a situation and act in a manner which will not give anybody an objective that is rational reason to misinterpret one's actions and be deceived by them. But one does not have to enlighten people where no enlightenment is objectively required and one does not have to worry about their subjective, irrational misinterpretations. In other words, do not fake reality, do not fake the evidence, do not fake your own person, and do not worry about or assume the responsibility for the judgment of others. If your behavior is objectively right, rational people will judge it correctly. As to irrational people, there is no way to prevent them from misinterpreting anything and no reason to care about them. Needless to say, you do not owe any honesty nor any other virtue or value to evil. 
to those who deal with you by force. When you are placed under the threat of physical violence, either by a criminal or a dictator, you do not owe him any truth. You do not sanction the double moral standard implied in any situation where a scoundrel counts on your virtue to serve his vice, where he demands that your good help him to commit his evil against you. If a hold-up man demands that you tell him where you have hidden your money, which he can't find, it is moral to lie. If the policemen of a dictatorship demand that you tell them the truth about your own convictions or your own actions, you have a moral right to lie your head off. You do not place your virtue, your honesty, in the service of their evil. When men are placed under force, under the threat of a gun, all morality is suspended in regard to the gun. He has suspended it. And thereafter, the only moral principle his victims have to observe is their own self-interest. Anything they choose to do in self-defense is morally right. This does not mean that they suspend morality in regard to other innocent victims, of course, but only in regard to the dictator or the gunman who initiated the use of physical force. It's not, of course, a matter of subjective choice, error or whim, to decide whether a given situation permits you to, in a manner of speaking, suspend morality. There is an objective principle by which one judges. The principle is the question of whether you commit an immoral action in order to gain some value which you would not possess otherwise or in order to protect a value which you possess by right and which is threatened by force. That is, whether you act to gain a positive or to negate a negative. In this last case, your action is not immoral. For example, if someone breaks into your house to burglarize it, he's seeking to grow richer, to get something he didn't have before. If you exercise force to prevent his entry, you don't grow any richer. You really keep a value that's already rightfully yours. The moral difference involved is the difference, of course, between murder and self-defense. Now, turning finally, in this discussion to another very basic principle of action virtue of the objectivist ethics, namely productiveness. In order to live, man must achieve the values his life requires. Man must think, then he must translate his thought into action. He must choose his goals, then he must proceed to achieve them. To accept the responsibility of achieving values, to accept responsibility for one's life, is to practice the virtue of productiveness. Just as it is not man's duty to spend his effort on supporting the existence of others, so it is not his right to exist as a parasite on the effort of others. Productiveness, quoting Galt, quote, is your acceptance of morality, your recognition of the fact that you choose to live, that productive work is the process by which man's consciousness controls his existence, a constant process of acquiring knowledge and shaping matter to fit one's purpose, of translating an idea into physical form, of remaking the earth in the image of one's values, close quote. Productiveness demands that you recognize that man is not a ghost, that thinking is not an end in itself, that the purpose of thought is action in physical reality, 
that man's life depends on the material expression and objectification of his knowledge and values. If man merely sits and thinks and dreams and projects goals and values and takes no action to bring any of it into reality, he will perish, or else live off those who do practice the virtue on which he has defaulted. So long as man lives, he is surviving either by his own effort or by someone else's. On the desert island, the virtue of productiveness would not be open to debate. Men would practice it, or they would cease to exist. The purpose of the morality of altruism, of the doctrine of self-sacrifice and service to others, is to make it possible for certain human beings living in society to practice that which would kill them if they tried it on the desert island. You are morally free to choose any form of work you wish, provided two conditions are fulfilled. That the activity you have chosen is rational, and that it demands the fullest use of your mind. The man who works very hard at selling phony stocks isn't practicing the virtue of productiveness, and neither is the man who settles into a job he can perform while nine-tenths of his consciousness is out of focus. This doesn't mean, of course, that you are immoral if, on the way to your chosen goal, you are obliged to work at odd jobs requiring less than your full capacity. Then you use your mind outside of office hours if its uses are limited during work. But during work, you're not properly in an out-of-focus daze either. If it is a failure of productiveness to wish to work at less than one's capacity, it is equally a failure of productiveness and of morality to wish for a job that is beyond one's ability. This means that, for example, if you do not know how to run a haberdashery, do not aspire to be President of the United States. Do not allow the range of your action to exceed the range of your thought. Do not bluff your way into a job. Do not pretend skills you do not possess. Do not spend your life sneakily imitating motions you do not understand and frantically hoping that no one will find you out. Seek constantly to expand the range of your knowledge and of your competence, but in the meantime, if you do not know how to type, do not hire yourself out as a typist. If you do not know anything about business, do not try to earn your living in the stock market. If you have not yet decided whether or not you exist, do not undertake to teach classes in philosophy. Your work is the chief existential expression of your self-esteem, because your work is properly the major focus of your thinking. To exist purposefully, which means to pursue rational values, is not only a practical necessity of your survival, it's a necessity of mental health, of self-confidence, of self-esteem. Self-esteem requires that you be in control of your existence, and no control is possible to the man without a purpose. You remember the letter read to you by Mrs. Brandon in her lecture on efficient thinking, the letter written by a schizophrenic. You observed the total lack of logical connection or coherence in that letter, the associational rambling, the drifting from one unrelated subject to another. And it was pointed out to you that the cause of this was the inability of the schizophrenic to hold his mind to a purpose. It is a mental purpose that unifies and integrates one's thoughts and thus makes control over one's consciousness possible. Well, similarly, 
It is an action purpose, a goal to achieve in reality that unifies and integrates one's actions and makes control over one's existence possible. The more long-range the goal, the greater the integration. Not to have long-range purposes is to be motivated by chance, by the feelings, the invitations, the phone calls of the moment. Life and happiness are the consequence of pursuing and achieving rational values and your work is the means by which you achieve them. And because it is his work that maintains his life, it is his work that constitutes the basic source of man's happiness, the foundation of the other forms of happiness that he can hope to experience. It is his work that provides man with a sense of efficacy, of control over reality, without which no other enjoyment is possible. There is no one so incapable of achieving pleasure as the professional pleasure chaser, the man who imagines that he can have a celebration without having achieved anything to celebrate, the man who imagines that he can enjoy other values without having to achieve self-value. I want to conclude this discussion of productiveness with one final point. And that is that women are human beings too. They are not a different species. And everything said about the necessity of existing purposefully and creatively applies to them. It is as morally and psychologically improper for a woman to have no creative or productive goal, no career, as it would be for a man. A woman may decide for a few years to spend her time on the job of motherhood. This isn't a lifetime career. It's a short-term career at best. It's not her metaphysical duty to do so, not her moral duty, not her destiny. It's a choice of a career, a short-range one like any other. And if she chooses it, she has to bring to it the fullest rationality, the most conscientious intellectual discipline of which she is capable. She has to realize that enormous intellectual discipline, conscientiousness, thoughtfulness, is required to train and educate children properly and to prepare them for adult life. She must not regard herself as a breeding machine whose fitness for motherhood is achieved solely by the possession of the appropriate biological apparatus. In this connection, there is a book which I want very enthusiastically to recommend to you, and that, of course, is Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, because this is a superb analysis of the sociological and psychological disaster which has resulted from the notion that woman's destiny is in the kitchen and the nursery and that careers are exclusively for men. She has a great deal very interesting to say about how this mystique developed and what kind of tragedies it leads to. One of the most interesting facts in the book is that the highest incidence of nervous breakdowns, of neurotic collapses, of emotional disturbances among women is to be found in women who have gone through college and therefore presumably displayed some level of intelligence and who after leaving college, decided to confine themselves exclusively to the role of wife and mother. The highest incidence of psychological breakdown occurs among women in this group. The fact that the culture sanctions a far greater degree of passivity in women than in men 
doesn't make it moral and doesn't make it psychologically healthy. To be continued next week. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This evening, we turn to a very important and very central concept in the objectivist ethics, namely, the virtue of justice. This is the one virtue in the objectivist ethics, which specifically is a social virtue, by which I mean the one virtue that specifically pertains to men's relationship with one another. Justice is the virtue that the majority of men pay lip service to, but only a rare minority practice. Why? Because justice pertains to one's judgment, not of nature, but of men. Justice is incompatible with the conventional ethics of altruism. It is incompatible with the creed of self-sacrifice. And by the same token, it is the crucial and, as I say, the only specifically social virtue of the objectivist morality. Objectivism holds, as you of course know, that justice and not sacrifice should be the ruling principle in human relationships. Justice, to quote Galt, is, quote, the recognition of the fact that you must judge all men as conscientiously as you judge inanimate objects. With the same respect for truth, with the same incorruptible vision, by as pure and as rational a process of identification. That every man must be judged for what he is and treated accordingly. That just as you do not pay a higher price for a rusty chunk of scrap than for a piece of shining metal, so you do not value a rotter above a hero." Close quote. The immediate protest of the mystic altruist contingent would be, oh no, how cruel and materialistic to judge men as one judges inanimate objects. Well, let's understand the full and exact meaning of such a protest. Since presumably we judge inanimate objects rationally and objectively, the only alternative is to judge men irrationally and non-objectively to ignore what they are, to disregard their character, in a word, to judge them unjustly. The mystic altruist definition of justice, as opposed to Galt's, would read something like the following. You must not judge men as conscientiously as you judge inanimate objects. Truth is not the only consideration. Higher things may be permitted to cloud your vision. You must not judge men by a pure or a rational process of identification. No man must be judged for what he is. Your treatment of him must bear no relation to his character. You must not value a hero above a rotter. It will hurt the rotter's feelings. To judge men as one judges inanimate objects does not mean to judge them as if they were inanimate objects, it means to judge them by the same epistemology, by the same rules of reason and logic. And that is what the mystic altruists dread. And while they prattle that reason is materialistic and mercy is superior to justice, what their theories mean, in fact, in reality, is that inanimate objects deserve the full focus of man's consciousness, but human beings do not. That inanimate objects deserve the effort of man's rational awareness, of logic, of thought, but human beings do not. 
that inanimate objects are worthy of justice, but human beings are not. No, of course, this is not what the mystic altruists say, but this is what they practice. As proof, look at mankind's progress in the realm of the material sciences, where reason is the standard for judging inanimate objects, then look at mankind's brutality, terror, and despair in the moral realm of human relationships from which reason and justice have been banned. The killer tenet in this issue is the slogan that mercy is superior to justice. Like self-sacrifice, it is a precept that has been smuggled into men's minds by degrees, through the back door, by means of sloppy definitions, woozy generalities, evasions, and emotional package dealing. Just as most people believe that self-sacrifice means nothing more than some vague sort of kindness, like giving dimes to beggars or contributing to charity drives, and do not realize by what steps they are being pushed into a sacrificial furnace. So most people believe that mercy means nothing more than some vague sort of forgiveness toward petty and repentant offenders. But this is not what mercy means. Even among its advocates, few care to admit to themselves or to others what it actually does mean. The example of mercy which its advocates usually offer is as follows. A judge has the power to sentence a young first offender to serve a jail term of from two to ten years, but he considers mitigating circumstances and gives him the shorter rather than the longer term. Most people accept this as an example of mercy, but this is not an act of mercy, it is an act of justice. If there are circumstances mitigating the boy's guilt, it would be unjust to impose on him a punishment heavier than he deserves. It is precisely in order to weigh mitigating circumstances that judges are given latitude in the choice of punishment. A judge who, in the same case, would impose a 10-year sentence, ignoring the evidence in favor of the boy, would not be unmerciful but unjust. Justice is not arbitrary. It is not a favor. It is not arbitrary kindness nor arbitrary severity. Justice consists of pronouncing judgment in accordance with all the relevant facts, in accordance with reality. Mercy, on the other hand, is arbitrary. Mercy is a favor. It consists of granting an unearned and undeserved kindness, a kindness contrary to facts and to reality. Mercy consists of kindness superseding reality. If a so-called merciful judge gave the lightest sentence in his power to a hardened criminal, in defiance of all the evidence proving that the man was a monster, that would be mercy. And if a year later, a merciful parole board set the criminal free, that would be mercy. And if a month later, the criminal murdered three people while holding up a store and robbing the cash register of $6.75, that would be the result of mercy. Well, today's law courts and newspapers are full of such instances of mercy. If an employer forgives an employee for an accidental error, the first in six months of efficient and conscientious service, that is not mercy but justice. If an employer keeps forgiving the constant errors of an incompetent employee who does not propose to focus on his work, that is mercy. If you do not know how to judge the character of a person because the facts available to you are insufficient and the evidence of his flaws is inconclusive, you must give him the benefit of the doubt, not on the ground of mercy, 
but on the ground of justice, because to let off the guilty is less disastrous than to condemn the innocent, because virtues are more important than flaws, because justice demands that a man be considered innocent until proved guilty, and this principle applies in law courts as well as in your personal relationships with people. Except that in personal relationships, when you give the benefit of the doubt, you do not dismiss the case. You wait for further evidence to prove the good or bad character of the person before you pass a moral judgment. Mercy is a concept that applies to and is called upon only by the evil, never by the good. If a man has committed a heroic or virtuous deed, what he asks is justice, not mercy. If a man has committed a despicable or vicious deed, what he dreads is justice, and what he cries for is mercy. The desire for mercy is always the desire to escape from the objective facts of reality. There is the old joke about the friend who looks at the portrait of a woman and says to her, it's a wonderful portrait that really does you justice, whereupon the woman replies angrily, I didn't want justice, I wanted mercy. Now I will read to you a dictionary definition of mercy and ask you to listen carefully and observe the implications of the concepts used. It's a good test for you as you listen to this definition of your ability to grasp philosophical implications. This is from the American College Dictionary. Quote, Mercy, one, Compassion or kindly forbearance shown toward an offender, an enemy, or other person in one's power. Compassion, pity, or benevolence. Two, disposition to be merciful. Three, discretionary power as to clemency or severity, pardon or punishment, or the like. Four, an act of forbearance, compassion, or favor, especially of God toward his creatures." Close quote. Observe two concepts that are central to this definition, guilt and arbitrary power. Guilt is implied by such terms as forbearance, offender, pity, clemency, pardon, punishment. These terms are not applicable to virtue or to innocence. They are applicable only to those who are guilty of some crime or wrong or evil. Arbitrary power is implied by such phrases as an offender, an enemy, or other person in one's power. Discretionary power as to clemency or severity pardon or punishment. An act of forbearance, compassion, or favor, especially of God toward his creatures. Close quote. What picture of the judged and the judges does this definition project? The judged are wretches who are guilty of evils that deserve punishment, who can hope for kindness only as an undeserved favor. The judges are omnipotent dictators who hold these wretches in their discretionary power, a power akin to God's, and who dispense forbearance, compassion, clemency, pardon, as an arbitrary favor of their arbitrary whim. This is the exact meaning of mercy and the exact motive of those who advocate it. And this is what we are asked to place above justice. Mercy, which you hear extolled as a moral virtue, is an anti-moral concept. It pertains to and implies moral anarchy, a view of existence where moral values are inoperative, where men's fate is not determined by their virtues or vices, and men need not consider the consequences of their actions, 
since virtues may not necessarily bring rewards and vices may not necessarily bring punishment, since causality may be suspended by a power superior to moral principles. The power of the arbitrary whim of who? Well, whoever gets himself into the position of ruler over men willing to live at his mercy. Now, the logical question to ask yourselves is this. Who would have a vested interest in upholding this sort of view? Who would have reason to long for an escape from morality and to hope that a deserved retribution may somehow be diverted from his head? Only the man who is guilty and intends to remain guilty. Only the man who has committed evil and intends to continue committing evil. Mercy is a blank check on and a license to evil. As in the case of any other vicious, irrational concept, the men who uphold mercy long for both sides of the coin and see themselves in both roles, as the judged and the judges as the recipients and as the dispensers of unearned favors. They expect a chance to be in both positions according to where they might land in the future. A chance to dispense the undeserved to groveling wretches as insurance against the day when it will be their turn to grovel. Judge not that ye be not judged. Now who has no interest in this view of existence, whose interests are not included in the concept of mercy, who is eloquently absent from the definition of mercy that I read, the innocent and the virtuous. They are the men who do not need mercy, but who do need justice. It is the men of innocence and the men of virtue who need acknowledgement and recognition, who need to be treated for what they are, who need no favors, only the justice of receiving that which they have earned and deserved, that which is theirs by right. These are the men whose existence the concept of mercy blanks out. There is a reason for that blank out. All evils are committed against men, not against physical nature or inanimate objects. You cannot be evil toward a table, a chair, or a chunk of stone, only toward a human being. Every act of evil has victims. And if one is to give an undeserved benefit, any kind of undeserved benefit, to an evildoer, one has to take it away from his victims. One has to do it at the expense of his victims. Consider this carefully. There is no exception to this rule. For instance, if a man steals a hundred dollars, is caught, and the judge orders him to return eighty dollars, but out of mercy allows him to keep twenty, it is from the victim of the theft that these twenty dollars are taken. Now this, of course, is the simplest example, but it is the exact and irrevocable pattern of any act of mercy. The principle involved is an absolute, and what obscures it is the fact that most of the actual instances of mercy are much more complex, and therefore, the harm of the victims is not as directly immediately perceivable. What obscures it further is the fact that the injustice involves spiritual as well as material benefits granted to the guilty at the expense of the innocent. Justice is a moral principle. All moral principles deal with values by which one guides one's choices and actions. Moral values determine our evaluations of our fellow men their importance to us, and our attitude and policies toward them. Take the example I cited earlier of the judge who was merciful toward a criminal, which resulted in the murder of three innocent victims. To be merciful, the judge had to drop the context of the man's crime, ignore the harm which the man had done his victims, and be concerned only with the man's interest 
forgetting the interests of his victims. Whether the judge intended it consciously or not, his action meant, in fact, that he considered the criminal important but the victims unimportant. That the undeserved concern he granted to the criminal reduced by that exact degree the concern he owed to the victims. That in terms of moral appraisal, he evaluated the criminal as more than the man actually was by means of evaluating the victims as less than they actually were. The first spiritual consequence of this injustice is the bitterness and disillusionment of the victims, who would rightfully feel that the light penalty imposed on the criminal for the heavy injury he had done to them meant that the society of their fellow men, by the verdict of the judge as society's representative, did not care about them, the victims, did not consider them important, did not choose to defend them. They would feel it necessarily, whether they identified it consciously or not, because such were the facts and such is the nature of the feeling of any man who has ever suffered an injustice. This feeling is the start or the confirmation of that sense of hopelessness and suspicion which most men feel toward one another. Hopelessness in regard to ever finding justice or fairness. Suspicion in regard to always watching out for unexpected, unprovoked, injury or malice. Such is the first consequence of the judge's mercy and the manner in which the spiritual benefit of the guilty is granted at the expense of the innocent. The undeserved pleasure of the criminal at his light sentence, the feeling of, I got away with it, and the undeserved pain of the victims, the feeling of moral loneliness, of the feeling there's nobody to defend me. The ultimate consequence of the judge's mercy is the murder of the three innocent men by the released criminal. It is not an accidental consequence. Whether any evader, such as that judge, chooses to think of it or not, every value judgment reflects a moral principle. And a principle is an abstraction that applies to a countless number of concretes. And there are no out-of-context judgments because the full context of any situation continues to exist in reality, whether any evader had dropped it or not. Therefore, by his action, the judge had upheld, declared, and put into reality the principle that the good is to be subordinated and sacrificed to the evil. It is only a matter of time and degree until this principle leads to its ultimate consequences. And it is of no importance whether the three murdered victims were three new persons or the same men whom the criminal had victimized earlier. What is important is that all the victims were concrete representatives of the same moral abstraction which the judge's mercy had ignored and sacrificed. They were innocent men. It is not revenge that the victims of evil need, but moral support. The sense that their fellow men stand by them, take seriously an offense against them, and punish it severely. It is the sense of living in a moral society. The meaning of imposing on a criminal a punishment commensurate with the seriousness of his crime is not just to make him suffer, though he deserves it, but to give an objective, factual expression to the moral principle that the evil are not to benefit by their evil. That no man may violate the rights of another with impunity. That the physical and spiritual consequences of evil are to be borne by the evildoer, not by his victims. And that a society of moral men will not go by in passive indifference and let the victims absorb the pain which the criminal has caused them, and which is often irreparable. Let me illustrate the proceeding in the following way. Suppose that some drunken driver, say an irresponsible playboy with political connections, runs over your child and kills him in an accident caused by wanton deliberate negligence. He shows no regret or repentance, 
has no mitigating excuses to offer, but is let off without punishment due to his political connections. You will feel a just and terrible indignation against the courts and against society in general. If then you discover one day that your best friend is running around with that playboy, will you be able to continue the friendship? Or will you feel that if he valued you at all, he would never tolerate the man who caused you so profound a suffering? You would drop your friend, of course, and the bitter indignation you would feel against him is the feeling of being let down, abandoned denied the moral solidarity one had expected and deserved, which is experienced by all victims of unpunished evils on a personal and social scale. An unpunished wrong is a shrug of indifference at the pain of the right. And this is the kind of social poison that every act of mercy to an evildoer spreads through a society. If goodwill among men is a desirable social state, then no such goodwill is possible if men lose respect for the moral caliber of their fellow men. If they come to regard one another, not as well-meaning friends, but as amoral, indifferent cynics. The collapse of moral standards is necessarily to the disadvantage of the good men and to the advantage of the evil. Such are the spiritual consequences of mercy to criminals, the discouragement and disillusionment of the virtuous element in people, the encouragement of the vicious element. The practical physical consequences are obvious. Mercy is a license to further evil, as you can read in terms of the results clearly in the newspaper. Now, if you understand the workings of mercy, consider a few more examples. If you succumb to pleas for mercy toward juvenile delinquents, what is your moral injustice toward the victims they have robbed or murdered, toward the families, the friends, and all those who had loved those victims? How much concern do you give them? How lightly do you evaluate their pain? To what embittered loneliness are you willing to abandon them? Or, if you hear pleas for mercy toward communists and Nazis, toward men who had heard or evaded the screams of millions of innocent victims that had been tortured in concentration camps, torture chambers and gas chambers, and had seen or evaded the blood of those victims on their own hands. If you hear pleas for mercy for such people, whether in the form of an action or merely in the form of spiritual kindness, just a touch of pity in your soul to replace the merciless loathing they deserve, what moral injustice are you willing to commit toward those victims? Would you be able to feel that pity while visualizing clearly, fully, and specifically those torture cellars, the blood, the screams, the twisted bodies, and distorted faces of the victims? No, you couldn't? Then that is the proof I wanted to give you, that one can feel pity or mercy for the guilty only at the price of ignoring, evading, and forgetting the fate of the innocent, that any undeserved benefit to the evil is granted at the expense of the good. This last is especially relevant today when one hears so many pleas for kindness or, quote, understanding, close quote, toward communists. And what is blanked out by these apostles of humanitarianism who plea for this kindness or mercy, what is blanked out is the amount of blood morally on the hands of any adult human being sympathetic to communism in the modern world. What is blanked out is how many million victims at this point. That is what has to be evaded totally in order to talk about kindness or mercy toward the sympathizers with dictatorships. You can now appreciate more fully the meaning of Reardon's thoughts in the following passage from Atlas Shrugged, quote, 
When one acts on pity against justice, it is the good whom one punishes for the sake of the evil. When one saves the guilty from suffering, it is the innocent whom one forces to suffer. There is no escape from justice. Nothing can be unearned and unpaid for in the universe, neither in matter nor in spirit. And if the guilty do not pay, then the innocent have to pay it." Close quote. Such is the meaning of mercy. The penalizing of virtue for being virtue, the rewarding of vice for being vice, the sacrifice of the good to the evil. And such is the full meaning of the slogan that mercy is superior to justice. A symptom of the degree to which this monstrous doctrine has permeated our culture is the fact that most people think of justice only as an issue pertaining to law courts, to criminals, to the punishment of evil, to dealing with negatives. And few people ever think of justice toward the good. Yet that is the primary moral purpose and meaning of justice. Justice consists of acknowledging the good, not merely of denouncing the evil, of rewarding virtue, not merely of punishing vice, of fostering the positive, not merely of stopping the negative. What, after all, is justice in relationship to the basic standard of man's life? Why is justice a cardinal virtue? Because justice is the policy of rewarding those actions of men which are pro-life and of condemning or penalizing those actions of men which are anti-life of supporting, complimenting, encouraging, praising that which is good, meaning, that which is conducive to, contributory to, in accordance with man's survival, condemning, punishing, denouncing that which is inimical to man's life and survival. And justice is not the monopoly of law courts. Law courts are only its final expression and result. Its source and practice is in the moral judgments of individual men, and these moral judgments determine the kind of law courts men will get. In his relation with others, every man must be a judge, a moral judge, a function the mystics and altruists have good reason to fear. And justice, not mercy, must be your standard of appraisal, which means that you must judge every man for what he is and treat him accordingly. You must regard the act of your moral appraisal as solemnly as the strictest, most honorable judge regards his responsibility in a court of law, and you must carry out the verdicts you pass. Your moral approval or disapproval is your only means of rewarding virtue and punishing evil, and it is a much more potent weapon than most of you probably suspect. Not only will it bring pleasure or pain, support or discouragement to those you meet in person, and if you are just, will have importance for both the good men and the evil, but the standard of justice in a whole society will be determined by those who have the courage and accept the responsibility of passing moral judgments. If today we live in an age of outrageous injustice, it is because the mystic altruists are setting the moral standards and the better men are keeping silent. Therefore, in place of the slogan, judge not that ye be not judged, objectivism answers, judge and be prepared to be judged. And more, be prepared to be judged for your judgments, because one of the solemn responsibilities entailed in the act of passing moral judgments and one of the reasons why most men are frightened to pass them is precisely because any third person is then able to look at your judgment, and to look at the object of your judgment, and to judge you on the basis of the kind of judgment you have passed. And that is precisely the responsibility which many men dread. The recognition, the acknowledgement, the loyalty, the admiration which you owe 
to those who deserve such responses, to men of virtue and achievement, are a much more important act of justice than the mere condemnation of evil. The positive is always much more important than the negative. It is much more important to express in action, to translate into reality, your admiration for John Galt than your contempt for Wesley Mouch. But, by the same token, you must never fail to express your contempt for Wesley Mouch and never soften it with any mercy, because if you do, that is an act of treason to Galt and to all the men of virtue in the world. If you feel concern for suffering, be concerned first with the suffering of the virtuous, with the suffering of a genius, with the suffering of a Hank Reardon, and give thought to relieving it before you start worrying about the suffering of the village idiot or of James Taggart. There can be no darker immorality and injustice than the idea that the men of greatness, of ability, of achievement deserve no concern by reason of their greatness, ability, and achievement, and that the mediocrities deserve concern by reason of their mediocrity. That is the penalizing of virtue for being virtue. It is the virtue of justice that represents the most profound cleavage between the objectivist ethics and the mystic altruist collectivist axis. Justice is the concept they cannot accept or touch or approach, not any inch or part of it, because the whole of the altruist collectivist doctrine rests on injustice to human ability and achievement, rests on the concepts of mercy, charity, expropriation, rests on the necessity of unpaid supporters, unrewarded producers, unacknowledged keepers of, and sacrificial animals to, the weaknesses, flaws, defaults, and depravities of their brothers. Justice is the concept which the altruist collectivists ignore, evade, blank out, and squirm to escape, as in medieval legends, the devil was supposed to squirm at the sight of holy water. The cause of the most savage attacks, which you may have heard leveled against objectivism, all those attacks which are hidden behind the smokescreen of the alleged issue of selfishness, in fact, all hang on the virulent animosity towards the principle of justice as presented in the objectivist literature. There are too many examples in Miss Fran's novels of the enormous magnanimity and generosity which the heroic characters in the novel show toward the innocent good for anybody honestly to call such characters heartless or cruel or other adjectives of that kind. When they call them heartless or cruel, what the critics will never tell you, but in fact you may know to be a fact, that what is bothering them is not their lack of compassion or kindness or generosity toward the innocent suffering good, which as I say the heroes do exhibit, but rather their lack of any such compassion toward the evil, toward characters such as James Taggart. It's precisely the hero's concern for man the victim that makes them so ruthlessly unsympathetic toward man the killer. And it's either or. Either you feel sympathy for the innocent, or you feel sympathy for the guilty. If you feel sympathy for the guilty, you can only feel it at the expense of the innocent. Today, as you know, there is a very strong animus against passing moral judgments of any kind whatsoever. Anything can be forgiven or tolerated in our culture except somebody who will pass moral judgments. Let anybody pass an uncompromising moral judgment about anything, and I don't have to tell you that it's upon his neck that all of the humanitarian axes will fall. 
It is an age of extreme moral cynicism, of mawkish sentimentality towards evil, and an age in which anything is to be forgiven, anything is to be understood, except, as I say, anybody who dares to point out that the evil is the evil. Have you ever seen any such virulent demonstrations of hate mongering as the wrathful accusations against anybody, for example, who chose to remind any liberals that it was, after all, a communist and not the right winger who assassinated Mr. Kennedy. The same liberals who were talking about hate groups and the poison that they allegedly spread through the atmosphere were guilty of and were spreading across the newspapers and magazines of the country the most hysterical, the most ferocious outpourings of wrath, hatred, denunciations, and curses upon anybody who didn't feel love for everybody. Their policy was love everybody and forgive everything or we'll cut your throats. <laughs> In other words, and to summarize, in our age, anything is to be forgiven except justice. That, more than any other single issue, is what the objectivist ethics is attacked for and criticized for, and that's central to its war with the prevailing values of our culture. We'll take a break now of 10 minutes and then continue. Let us turn now to a discussion of the virtue of pride and its place in the objectivist ethics. The virtue of pride consists of loyalty to one's life, that is, to one's mind, to one's values, to one's happiness. It is an act of pride to value nothing above one's own mind. It is an act of pride to live by nothing but one's values. It is an act of pride to live for nothing but one's happiness. Pride, to quote Galt, is, quote, that radiant selfishness of soul which desires the best in all things, in values of matter and spirit, a soul that seeks above all else to achieve its own moral perfection, valuing nothing higher than itself." Close quote. Pride is, first and foremost, moral ambitiousness. It is the virtue of desiring to be virtuous, of holding one's character as one's proudest achievement. Pride is the ambition for moral perfection. And you must start by understanding what is moral perfection, what it is that you must demand of yourself in order to achieve full self-esteem. Conventional morality holds, as you all know, that moral perfection is impossible to man. And so it is if omniscience and self-immolation are the standard. When you consider the incredible things which conventional morality holds up to men as moral ideals, it's not surprising that the advocates of such a morality are driven to declare that perfection is beyond man's reach. You would think that men would stop and reconsider their position 
when they discover that they advocate a code that cannot be practiced. But they do not because, among other reasons, they have a vested interest in the doctrine of man's necessary imperfection. It provides a marvelous blank check. It opens the way to any irrationality on the premise of who's perfect. An illustration of this, let me tell you a little story. A man who presented himself as staunchly religious was talking one day to a friend of mine. The man began to boast about his many infidelities to his wife. When my friend asked how such behavior was to be reconciled with the man's religious beliefs, the man answered, Oh, but, but I don't aspire to be perfect. That would be the sin of pride. <laughs> Which is just about the neatest answer I have ever heard. <laughs> there are many reasons why there could be a vested interest in the doctrine of the human imperfectibility. One, of course, is that it is, as I have just indicated, a marvelous screen and rationalization for any kind of moral failure. It's also a rationalization to protect the advocates of and mystical morality from having to admit that their morality doesn't make sense. You see, their morality is flagrantly impractical, impracticable, cannot be followed consistently by anybody who wishes to remain alive. Their way out of blaming their morality is to blame human nature instead and say, well, of course it can't be practiced with full consistency. That shows you the intrinsic defect of human nature. So it's human nature rather than their morality which takes the blame. Again, quoting from Galt's speech, quote, discard that unlimited license to evil which consists of claiming that man is imperfect. By what standard do you damn him when you claim it? Accept the fact that in the realm of morality, nothing less than perfection will do. But perfection is not to be gauged by matters not open to your choice. Man has a single basic choice, to think or not, and that is the gauge of his virtue. Moral perfection is an unbreached rationality not the degree of your intelligence, but the full and relentless use of your mind. Not the extent of your knowledge, but the acceptance of reason as an absolute. Learn to distinguish between errors of knowledge and breaches of morality. An error of knowledge is not a moral flaw, provided you are willing to correct it. Only a mystic would judge human beings by the standard of an impossible, automatic omniscience. But a breach of morality is the conscious choice of an action you know to be evil, or a willful evasion of knowledge, a suspension of sight and of thought. That which you do not know is not a moral charge against you, but that which you refuse to know is an account of infamy growing in your soul. Make every allowance for errors of knowledge, do not forgive or accept any breach of morality. Give the benefit of the doubt to those who seek to know, but treat as potential killers those specimens of insolent depravity who make demands upon you, announcing that they have and seek no reasons, proclaiming as a license that they just feel it, or those who reject an irrefutable argument by saying it's only logic, which means it's only reality. Close quote. The first definition, the first meaning, therefore, of the virtue of pride consists of moral ambitiousness. As I say, 
the virtue of desiring to be virtuous. Let me mention parenthetically, just to cut off a possible misunderstanding, that pride is used in a psychological sense with a somewhat different meaning, a related but different meaning. Here, the concept of pride is used to refer to a virtue. Pride can also be used in a psychological context to designate an emotional state, as when we say, I feel proud of something, of this or that or this achievement. And in such a case, pride means, of course, the emotional response to values one has achieved, the pleasure one takes in values that one has achieved, either in action or in one's own character. So that, for example, if you do something very difficult, you can say, I feel proud of myself. And this is a form of taking pleasure in some value which you have achieved, some action which you have successfully performed. And here, of course, pride then refers to an emotional state. But in the context of tonight's discussion, as a virtue, the primary meaning of pride is this attitude of moral ambitiousness. Moral ambitiousness is the meaning of pride in relationship to consciousness. In relation to existence, it consists of selfishness, the attitude, the principle, the policy of selfishness. But just as you must understand what is moral perfection, so you must understand what is selfishness. To be selfish means to be concerned with one's own interests. Be selfish means to live for one's own sake and by one's own mind. Selfishness does not mean the sacrifice of others to self. It is here that the objectivist concept of selfishness differs crucially from the conventional concept. In conventional morality, as you know, man is confronted with only two moral alternatives to be selfless and sacrifice himself to others, or to be selfish and sacrifice others to himself. As historical symbols of this issue, men have been told in effect that the only choice is Christ or Hitler. To quote from Rourke's courtroom speech, quote, as poles of good and evil, man was offered two conceptions egoism and altruism. Egoism was held to mean the sacrifice of others to self. Altruism, the sacrifice of self to others. This tied man irrevocably to other men and left him nothing but the choice of pain. His own pain born for the sake of others or pain inflicted upon others for the sake of self. When it was added that man must find joy in self-immolation, trap was closed. Man was forced to accept masochism as his ideal under the threat that sadism was his only alternative. This was the greatest fraud ever perpetrated upon mankind. This was the device by which dependence and suffering were perpetuated as fundamentals of life. The choice is not self-sacrifice or domination. The choice is independence or dependence. Close quote. Observe, and this is one of the major points in the fountainhead, that the man who sacrifices others is as selfless as the man who sacrifices himself. Both are total dependents. Both live through others. Both make others the goal of their life. Neither lives by his own mind. Masochism and sadism are not opposites. They are two sides of the same coin. Just as it would be preposterous for a psychologist to assert that masochism and sadism are man's only alternatives, so it is preposterous and monstrous for a moralist to assert it.
I'm sure that all of you have run up against the following phenomenon. One has only to enter into a discussion with a stranger on the subject of ethics and to make the statement that one advocates a morality of self-interest in order to invite an explosive reply of some such kind as the following. What? You believe in trampling over people and doing whatever you feel like doing? Don't you have any respect for the rights of anybody else? You think it's just right to murder or rape or rob or do anything you want just so you get what you want? A rational man does not perceive his self-interest in the violation of the rights of others, nor in exploiting them, nor in robbing and murdering them. It is an interesting commentary on the souls of conventional moralists that they do think that this is what self-interest consists of. When you announce that yours is an ethics of self-interest, all a listener can know so far is that you are repudiating the ethics of altruism. The logical question which he should ask you is, and what do you think is to man's self-interest? Then you proceed to tell, to spell out, what is the content of your moral code. When you announce that yours is an ethics of self-interest, this is really an introduction. It's not yet a statement as to what your ethics is all about. Because the big question is, what is to your self-interest? What is to man's self-interest? What does it depend on? And it's the job of a rational ethicist precisely to answer those questions, to define what does man's self-interest consist of. A morality that holds life as its standard of value is by that very fact I want you to notice necessarily a morality of egoism, of self-interest, of selfishness. There is nothing more selfish than wanting to live. There is nothing more selfish than breathing. But like life and like happiness, that which constitutes your self-interest is not arbitrary. It is not a matter of personal whim. It is not an issue that can be divorced from reason, reality, and your own nature. If a man is to be selfish, that is, to be concerned with his own self-interest, he is obliged to face such questions as, what does my self-interest consist of? What goal should I seek in life which will be maximally contributory to my self-interest? By what principles should I act in dealing with reality and other men if I am to secure my self-interest? If he is not concerned to deal with those questions, he cannot in any legitimate or serious sense be said to be concerned with his self-interest. Because to be concerned with your self-interest means to give the issue of your self-interest some sort of thought or rational consideration. If you don't, if you act like a range of the moment animal, it's true that you're not in that case motivated by concern for the interests of others, but that doesn't mean that you're motivated by the concern for the interests of self. It means you're acting without thinking one way or the other. Don't assume that if an action is not altruistic, it's therefore to your self-interest. Let me give you a simple example. If I were to pick up a hammer and start beating myself over the head, this would clearly not be an act of altruism. I hope you will agree it would not be an act of altruism. <laughs> would it then follow that it would be an act of selfishness? Would it be an act expressive of my self-interest? Clearly not. It would be a self-destructive action. It wouldn't, it's true, be an action aimed at anybody else's benefit, 
but by no stretch of the imagination could it be said to be aimed at my benefit. Therefore, there are actions which are to our self-interest and actions which are not to our self-interest. Of those actions which are not to our self-interest, some are aimed at the interests of others. Others aren't aimed at anybody's interests, one's own or anybody else's. So let's be very clear upon this and don't imagine that the alternative is simply your interests or the interests of others. The man who acts against reason is not selfish. It is not selfish to make oneself unfit for dealing with the facts of reality. The man who acts on the blind impulse of the moment is not selfish. It is not selfish to renounce one's rational faculty. The man who robs and murders is not selfish. It is not selfish to end one's life in the electric chair or to spend it in terror hiding from the police or to spend it in terror wondering which member of one's gang is going to seek to replace one. The man who aspires to the position of dictator is not selfish. It is not selfish to require a food taster and to spend one's existence in part real, part paranoid terror that one may be assassinated at any moment by those conspiring to take one's place. The man who tries to live as something other than man is not selfish. It is not selfish to slap one's own nature in the face. It is selfish to remain loyal to one's mind. It is selfish to place no value above one's own rational judgment. It is selfish to pursue the values proper to one's own nature, the values that make life and happiness possible. It is selfish to deal with other men, not as a master or a slave, but as a traitor, to give value for value, neither to grant nor demand the unearned. It is selfish to want to live, learn to deserve it. In Ms. Rand's most recent work, The Virtue of Selfishness, to which I contributed a few essays, you will find the fullest non-fiction delineation of precisely what the objectivist concept of selfishness means. And you will find in this book a great deal of material supplementary and complementary, not only to this immediate discussion, but to the whole discussion of ethics. I am deliberately omitting, insofar as it's possible, those aspects of the objectivist ethics which are now available to you in the virtue of selfishness. But I do want to point out a few more aspects, a few more confusions relevant to the issue of selfishness. As I need hardly tell you, there probably isn't any issue about which there is more incredible confusion than over this issue. Altruism has acquired such a monopoly in men's minds that they virtually regard altruism as synonymous with morality or with goodness. They don't regard altruism as one particular theory of morality. They regard altruism as synonymous with morality and selfishness as, of course, synonymous with evil. You will remember at the end of part one of The Fountainhead, when Rourke turns down the commission at a time when he's financially desperate and his career seems ended before it's scarcely begun, and when he refuses to make certain changes in the design of a building, one of the directors of the corporation says to him, how can you be so fanatical and selfless? And Rourke looks at him in astonishment and says, this is the most selfish thing you've ever seen a man do. Well, of course, the director who asks Rourke this question is thinking in terms of the entirely conventional frame of reference. What he can understand Rourke's action as is only an issue of, quote, selflessness, close quote. Rourke recognizes, of course, that it is the most selfish thing that a man could do, precisely because Rourke's policy is he will not relinquish, sacrifice, subordinate his values for anything. If that isn't selfishness, what does selfishness mean? But so 
profoundly are people brainwashed over the issue of selfishness that one hears incredible misinterpretations and distortions of the Fountainhead and Atlas Shrugged, not only from the enemies of the books, but also from the friends. I remember some years ago meeting a man who was very enthusiastic over the Fountainhead and spoke to me for a few minutes about what a wonderful, inspiring book it was and how much he'd enjoyed reading with it, etc. and so forth. And then he remarked, what a marvelously selfless person Rourke was. If he wanted, in effect, to say Rourke is good or morally great, calls him selfless. And all of the book didn't penetrate or break up that notion in his mind. Many people were very distressed over the Falcon Head because distressed on just this count, because conventionally they would recognize that Peter Keating would be what is conventionally called selfish, except as the book makes perfectly clear, Keating hasn't got any self whatsoever. He's only a reflection of the values of others. And Rourke, who in many ways is the opposite, in fact, in all fundamental ways, is the opposite of Keating, the problem is you can't exactly call him selfless either. Yet you can't call him selfish, because selfish means Peter Keating. And many people would go away muttering that Ayn Rand is confused. <laughs> because they do not know how to think or will not think outside the conventional square. They are caught in a certain vice on this issue. And they cannot take a fresh look at what is the issue of selfishness and self-sacrifice all about. What does it mean in reality? One of the characteristics of an innovator in any field of endeavor is precisely this ability to look past the standard definitions, the standard formulas, that which everybody else takes as the given and to question the, the assumptions or the presuppositions in a given field on a deeper level than his contemporaries have done. And that, of course, is exactly what Miss Rand has done in the field of ethics. She has thought beneath this conventional assumption that the choice is, in effect, sacrifice of self for others or others for self. And said, in effect, the plague on both your houses, because both represent evils. Again, have we not been told that selfishness is the antonym of love, that love requires selflessness? By this theory, it is not to your self-interest to find other men who share your values. It's not to your self-interest to find human beings you can respect and admire human beings who face existence as you face it and who embody the same values and practice the same virtues. Well then what would be to your self-interest? What would you want if you were really selfish? To spend your life surrounded by men for whom you feel contempt? To spend your life without anyone who shares your values? It is in love above all else that you express yourself because what we love is the embodiment of our values in another person. A friend, said Aristotle, is another self. And it is with the person one loves that one feels freest to be oneself. This is not selfless. Pause on this last point. One of the significant criteria which affect us when we are falling in love, usually it affects most people subconsciously rather than consciously, is the thought, with this person I could be fully myself, I could express myself on more levels and more dimensions than with anybody else, because this person's way of thinking and feeling about life is like mine, and therefore I would have more affinities and more values to share and more levels of communication possible with this person than with any other. If these are not selfish considerations, what are they? Love would be selfless 
only if one practices an altruist morality. That is, if one were compelled to give one's love not to that which one admires, but to that which one deplores, not to that in which one sees values, but to that in which one sees flaws. The advocates of altruism are right from the point of view of their code when they hold pride as the worst of man's sins. No man of authentic pride will accept the doctrine that virtue consists of self-immolation. That requires the altruist virtue of humility, which means a miserable inferiority complex. Again, I want to remind you of a very significant statement in the Fountainhead, very relevant to our media discussion. I quote by memory, and therefore it's not verbatim, but it's in Tui's big final speech to Keating. And he, when he tells Keating that if a person is preaching self-sacrifice, preaching sacrifice, it stands to reason that there has to be somebody there to collect the sacrificial offerings and that he intends to be the collector. But if a person tells you that you have a right to live for your own happiness, that's the person who isn't seeking to exploit you. That's the person who isn't seeking to use you. That's the person who proposes to leave you free. And then Tui goes on to say, but let such a man come along and you'll run screaming your empty heads off that he's a selfish monster. So the racket, meaning the altruist racket, is safe for many, many centuries. It is a paradox that this incredible doctrine of altruism and self-sacrifice, this advocacy of humility, this constant preachment that man is born to suffer, to endure, to despise himself, to relinquish, to give up, to surrender, to renounce, is hailed as an ethics of benevolence and brotherly love. That is truly one of the most remarkable facts of human philosophical history, that such a hoax, such a fraud would have been, could have been perpetrated for so many centuries and accepted by so many people. Next week, I will turn to a discussion of the morality of altruism to a more detailed analysis of what the creed of self-sacrifice is all about, what are its philosophical presuppositions, what view of life does it entail and imply, what are its consequences. Many of you might think, perhaps some of you think, that uh, in Galt's characterization of what the altruist ethics is all about in uh, his radio speech, he states in a too extreme way what the mystic altruists are preaching or advocating. So next week, I am going to do something which I think you'll find rather interesting. I'm going to do some juxtaposing of paragraphs from Galt's speech with quotations from a variety of theologians and philosophers and ethicists. And uh, you can judge for yourself whether or not Galt's characterization of what altruism means, what the advocates of altruism stand for, is a correct one or not. You may be startled at some of the quotations which you'll hear. So, to be continued next week. Ladies and gentlemen, in my last lecture I discussed the virtue of justice and pride and productiveness. I pointed out that justice is the one specifically social virtue of the objectivist ethics, the virtue that pertains specifically to man's relationship with other men. 
I stated that self-interest is the only proper base and motive of human action, and that in their dealings with one another, men must neither grant sacrifices nor demand them. Among men who observe the principle of justice, men who do not grant sacrifices and who do not demand them, men who do not seek the unearned, there is no clash of interests. Such men deal with one another by voluntary consent, and only when they perceive that it is to their mutual benefit to do so. This is the only possible basis of social harmony and authentic goodwill among men. If men do attempt to gain the unearned and the undeserved, why then, of course, there are clashes of interest among them in the sense, you might say, that there is a clash of interest between a hold-up man and his victim. If men try to live by something other than reason and the mind, if they consider destruction a practical and valid means to gain their ends, if they hold their desires outside the context of reality and justice, if they feel free to place the I wish above the it is, and to act on their irrational wishes, then nothing but clashes of interest can exist among men. Neither harmony nor goodwill is possible in a society of cannibals. There is a very important formulation or statement in God's speech that I want to quote in this connection. Quote, the symbol of all relationships among rational men the moral symbol of respect for human beings is the traitor. We who live by values, not by loot, are traitors both in matter and in spirit. A traitor is a man who earns what he gets and does not give or take the undeserved. A traitor does not ask to be paid for his failures, nor does he ask to be loved for his flaws. A traitor does not squander his body as fodder or his soul as alms. Just as he does not give his work except in trade for material values, so he does not give the values of his spirit, his love, his friendship, his esteem, except in payment and in trade for human virtues, in payment for his own selfish pleasure which he receives from men he can respect. Unquote. If you want to understand how the concept of the traitor principle applies to the spirit, and if you want to understand what is its alternative, and if you want to know whether or not that alternative is desirable, ask yourself whether you would wish to be loved selflessly. Ask yourself whether you wish to be loved by someone who gains nothing from loving you, who will tell you that he loves you not for your virtues but for your weaknesses, that his motive is not admiration but pity, that he wants to marry you only because he knows you need him, that he loves you not for any selfish pleasure he finds in your character but only out of a sense of charity and duty. If your self-esteem recoils in revulsion at such a concept of love, question the motives and the psychology of those who advocate it as a moral ideal. Two people who do advocate it are Lillian Reardon and James Taggart and Atlas Shrugged. You will remember the scene where Lillian explains to Reardon her idea of what one should offer in love. I quote, quote, if you tell a beautiful woman that she is beautiful, what have you given her? It is no, it's no more than a fact, and it has cost you nothing. But if you tell an ugly woman that she is beautiful, you offer her the great homage of corrupting the concept of beauty. To love a woman for her virtues is meaningless. She's earned it. It's a payment, not a gift. But to love her for her vices is a real gift, unearned and undeserved. To love her for her vices is to defile all virtue for her sake, and that is a real tribute of love. 
because you sacrifice your conscience, your reason, your integrity, and your invaluable self-esteem. What's love, darling, if it's not self-sacrifice? Close quote. Or remember the scene between Cheryl and James Taggart when Cheryl is coming to realize the kind of monster she has married. She asks Jim, Jim, what is it that you want to be loved for? And he cries, what a cheap shopkeeper's attitude to be loved for. So you think that love is a matter of mathematics, of exchange, of weighing and measuring like a pound of butter on a grocery counter? I don't want to be loved for anything. I want to be loved for myself, not for anything I do or have or say or think. For myself, not for my body or mind or words or works or acts, Gerald asks him. But then, what is yourself? And he answers, if you loved me, you wouldn't ask it. You wouldn't ask. You'd know. You'd feel it. Why do you always try to tag and label everything? Can't you rise above those petty materialistic definitions? Don't you ever feel? Just feel? Perhaps you will think that James Taggart states his position too extremely, and that no one in real life believes such things. So I shall now refer you to the writings of Dr. Eric Fromm, a prominent contemporary psychologist. In his book entitled The Art of Loving, Dr. Fromm declares that, quote, love is the only sane and satisfactory answer to the problem of human existence. But, Dr. Fromm contends, it is very difficult to achieve love in a capitalistic society because, quote, the principle underlying capitalistic society and the principle of love are incompatible, close quote. The principle of capitalism is that of what Fromm himself terms fairness ethics. That's a quote from Fromm. The principle of fairness ethics, of trade, of the exchange of values. Individuals deal with one another only on the premise of mutual self-interest. They engage only in those transactions from which they expect a profit or reward. But to approach love with any concern for one's self-interest is, says Fromm, to negate the very essence of love. To love an individual is to feel care and responsibility for it is not to appraise his character as a commodity from which one expects pleasure. To love ideally is to love unconditionally. It is to love a human being, not for the fact of what he is, but for the fact that he is. It is to love without reference to values or standards or judgment. Again, quoting, in essence, all human beings are identical. We are all part of one. We are one. This being so, it should not make any difference who we love. Close quote. It should not make any difference whether the person we love is a being of stature or a total non-entity, a genius or a fool, a hero or a scoundrel. Consistent with this view of love, since, again, quote, in quote, in essence, all human beings are identical, unquote, Fromm concedes a certain logic to the idea of marriages arranged between partners who have not chosen nor perhaps even met each other. It is only the, quote, paradoxical character of human nature and of erotic love, unquote, that makes him feel that such marriages are inadvisable because, he explains, quote, erotic love requires certain specific highly individual elements which exists between some people, but not between all." Close quote. Paradoxical, isn't it? The desire to be loved unconditionally, the desire to be loved with no concern for his objective personal worth, is one of man's deepest longings, Fromm insists. Whereas to be loved on the basis of merit, quote, because one deserves it, unquote, invokes doubt and uncertainty, since merit has to be struggled for and since such love can be withdrawn should the merit cease to exist. Quote, 
Furthermore, deserved love easily leaves a bitter feeling that one is not loved for oneself, that one is loved only because one pleases." Unquote. It is the capitalistic culture that inculcates such concepts as the deserved and the undeserved, the earned and the unearned, and thus poisons the growth of proper love. Quote, love is an act of faith, unquote. Proper love should raise no questions about the virtue or character of its objects. It should desire no joy from such virtue as the object might possess. For if it does, it is not proper love, it is only capitalistic selfishness. Ladies and gentlemen, to love is to value. And the immorality of the concept of love advocated by Lillian Reardon by James Taggart and by Dr. Fromm, is that it seeks to divorce love from values, and worse, to oppose love and values. The proper answer to this concept of love is given by John Galt when he states, quote, a morality that professes the belief that the values of the spirit are more precious than matter a morality that teaches you to scorn a whore who gives her body indiscriminately to all men. This same morality demands that you surrender your soul to promiscuous love for all comers." Unquote. If any of you feel that the principle of justice is too cruel to be applied to love, you now know what is its alternative. I leave the choice to your self-esteem. Make no mistake about it, there are people who want unearned love, only they do not often state it as explicitly as Lillian Reardon or James Taggart. They do not want it identified that the love they get is unearned. They do not want to be told, I love you out of charity even though you don't deserve it. No, they want someone to fake it, to pretend that they do deserve it. For instance, if a woman tricks a man into marrying her, refuses to give him a divorce, and holds him through appeals to his sense of duty, she will not be content if he declares that every day he spends with her is an act of misery and self-sacrifice. She will keep pleading with him to admit that he is really happy, that things are really for the best. She will want him to fake a feeling he does not possess. Similarly, if a mother demands sacrifices from her children, she will not want her children to identify them as sacrifices. She will want her children to fake reality and to pretend that they are selfishly happy in obeying her. Now, you may ask, are there no circumstances under which it is proper to help other human beings? To help to offer help to other human beings, spiritually or materially, is a perfectly valid and proper human activity, provided neither you nor they regard it as your moral duty, provided it is not a sacrifice on your part. It can be perfectly reasonable to offer moral support or financial assistance to a human being who has achieved values of character you can respect, or who is fighting in a cause of which you approve, or who is putting up an honest struggle against adversity, or who is the victim of an injustice. To help other human beings when it can be done without self-sacrifice is a perfectly normal and healthy expression of human benevolence. And I wrote on this subject some years ago in the Objectivist Newsletter in an article entitled Benevolence versus Altruism, in which I distinguished between healthy, rational benevolence and goodwill for other human beings and the immoral creed of altruism which specifically demands self-sacrifice. I think you would also find it very valuable and rewarding to read an article of this 
Friends, which originally appeared in the Objectivist newsletter and was subsequently included in her collection of essays entitled The Virtue of Selfishness. The essay to which I refer is entitled The Ethics of Emergencies, which deals specifically with the circumstances under which help to others can be proper. I want to state, however, before moving on, that this whole question of help to others is really a minor issue. It is not the heart and essence of the science of ethics. Too many people on first hearing about the objectivist ethics start in effect by asking us what is our attitude toward giving quarters to beggars and helping village idiots. This is the last, not the first, issue of morality. It is not for the sake of dealing with beggars and village idiots that man needs a code of values. If life on earth is the standard, it is much more important to know what objectivism has to say about ability than about incompetence, about intelligence rather than stupidity, about achievement rather than helplessness about life rather than death. The view of existence contained in the altruist ethics is that disaster, calamity, and destruction are the normal and inevitable conditions of human life. Suffering, pain, and death swallow up the altruist view of life. He does not ask, how should man achieve happiness? He asks, how should man minimize suffering? He does not ask, how should man achieve life? He asks, how should man face death? The morality of altruism holds not life, but death as its standard of value. It holds as its cardinal virtues, faith, which is the destruction of the mind, self-sacrifice, which is the destruction of values, humility, which is the destruction of certainty and self-confidence. Objectivism, in contradistinction, holds reason, purpose, and self-esteem as its highest moral good. Ask yourself by simply contrasting these three alternatives, reason or faith, purpose or self-sacrifice, self-esteem or humility, which code leads to man's survival and which to his extinction. Does man survive by using his mind or by rejecting? Does he survive by achieving values or by renouncing them? Does his survival require the confidence that he is worthy and able to live? Or does it require that he suffer chronic anxiety and self-doubt? This last, I should mention, is what the virtue of humility actually The concept of self-sacrifice is the heart of the altruist morality, the motor that translates its abstract values into concrete, specific actions. Altruism preaches that man must live for the sake of others, that he must place their interests above his own, that their happiness, not his own, must be the goal of his life that self-sacrifice is the basic virtue and the standard by which all his actions must be judged. If the goal of an action is his own welfare, it is evil. If the goal is the welfare of others, it is good. If life is the ultimate goal of the objectivist ethics, then life is the standard of value and the good is that which life requires. Good actions consist of achieving, gaining, and keeping values, that is, those things which are required for man's proper survival qua man, by one's own effort and for one's own sake. But if death is the ultimate goal of a morality, then death is the standard of value, and the good is that which leads to death. Good actions consist not of gaining and keeping values, but of renouncing and sacrificing them. 
The basic rule of morality of life is a G. The basic rule of the morality of death is give up. Observe a crucial point. You cannot give up or renounce or sacrifice that which you do not possess or value. If sacrifice is a virtue, you must have something to sacrifice. Altruism does not tell you to abstain from pursuing values. It tells you to pursue values in order to sacrifice them. It tells you to gain values but not to keep them, to achieve them in order to give them up. It does not command you to commit suicide. It commands you to live in order to die. Let us examine the metaphysics of altruism, the view of existence implicitly contained in the morality of death. Since only the concept of life makes the concept of value possible, since the concept of value does not and cannot apply to inanimate objects or to corpses, since nothing is good or bad to a corpse, it would be impossible for man, impossible philosophically, psychologically, intellectually, emotionally, to hold death as a standard of value death in the actual literal sense of the word, with full conscious awareness of its meaning. Death is not another state of existence different from life. Death is non-existence, the nothing, the blank, the zero. It would be impossible for a living entity to hold its own annihilation as its highest value and to go on living. If any man attempted it, in the literal sense of the word, what would happen would be the total collapse of his consciousness. He would not be able to act, to think, or to feel anything, which means that he would not be able to hold any values whatever. In order to preach a morality of death, its advocates have to use life, in effect, as a stolen concept. They have to smuggle the concept of life into the consciousness of their victims, as well as into their own, or no such morality could become conceivable or communicable. All altruist moralities of any age, tribe, culture, or civilization had to promise man another life in exchange for renouncing the one he possesses another life in another dimension of another reality of a different universe in exchange for renouncing the life dimension reality and universe he knows another kind of existence in exchange for the one that exists without mysticism without the rejection of reason no altruist morality could be or ever has been possible to preach or accept altruism, men had to step outside reason, reality, and existence into the mystic's void. That other reality which the mystic altruists promise man after death is always alleged to be superior to the reality of this earth. But no specific identity or nature is ever ascribed to it, except in terms of negatives. We're told it's not like life on earth, it's not like anything which we would call the good here on earth. It's in effect a negation of just about every concept of existence we possess. In order to enter that higher realm, man has to live his life by a moral code dictated to him from that other world or dimension. By rules and standards belonging to the other world, no matter how much suffering it causes him in this one. In fact, the more he suffers in life, the greater will be his reward after death. Suffering is the price of admission and the currency he has to accumulate on earth in proof of his virtue. This leads us to the question, why are the demands of that other life opposite to the demands of man's life on earth? Why does his happiness in that other reality depend on his suffering on earth? 
The answer given by all mystic moralists is that this earth is evil by its very nature, evil metaphysically, and therefore a man must make himself worthy of that other reality which is good by pursuing its values here on earth, where they do not belong and are not metaphysically applicable. By what standard is the earth to be evaluated as evil? By the standard of that other reality. What is that other reality? It is non-earth. What are its values? The non-values on earth. Now I will remind you of two slogans. One is from the Bible, the meek shall inherit the earth. The other is from the communist hymn, the international. Who had been nothing shall be all. This will give you a clue to the motive, purpose, meaning, and origin of the altruist morality, and an inkling of who is to be sacrificed to whom. Remember that the concept value does not mean only material values, it also means spiritual values, intellectual values. Now translate the mystic's abstraction into its concrete specific meaning. If the values of that other reality are the non-values on earth, then the morally, intellectually, and spiritually inferior men here on this, in this world are to be the superior men in that other dimension. The men of self-esteem, the virtuous, the intelligent, the able, the strong, the brave, the creative, the independent, the happy. All those who are successful in the task of living on earth they are to be damned for it and punished in that other reality. While the contemptible men, the vicious, the stupid, the incompetent, the weak, the cowardly, the parasitical, the dependent, the suffering, all those who fail on the task of living on earth are to be blessed for it and rewarded in that other reality. It is not the unearned in matter that the mystics and altruists are after, but the unearned in spirit. It is not love for the so-called little people that moves them, but hatred for the men of greatness. And it is not kindness or help for suffering that they seek. If it were, they would not damn those who are able to provide it. Any projection of any imaginary other dimension in metaphysical opposition to the reality of this earth has only one philosophical and psychological meaning hatred and rejection of the actual nature of existence, hatred of man, of reason, of reality, a longing for a universe where A is not A, a universe without identity, without causality, without the necessity of effort, mind, or thought. As proof, the garden of Eden, heaven, paradise, nirvana, and all the projections of the mystic's ideal ever offered, all of which have as their basic common denominator the vision of an effortless existence, a vision of man as a happy automaton who is automatically provided with the satisfaction of all of his needs, wishes, or whims, relieved of the burden of the mind, and in the case of Nirvana, relieved even of the burden of existence. You have often heard it said that a mystical belief in another life after death serves as a consolation for men in their sorrows. The advocates of this viewpoint would claim that since suffering does exist on earth, there is no harm if helpless, unhappy men find consolation in projecting another happier existence, and that this is the only effect of mysticism on human life. The only purpose of a mystic creed as far as life on earth is concerned. But if this were true, why do the mystics attempt to make their other dimension real here on earth? If their higher realm is the opposite of this one, why do they teach men a morality which is impossible to practice on earth and which leads only to agony? The full philosophical answer is that there are no two or four or six realities, but only one reality, the one in which we live, and there is no escape from it. Whatever metaphysical view men hold of the nature of existence, 
It is in this reality that they will practice it. There is no other. If men believe that flaws, vices, weaknesses, defects are values, that to fail at the task of living on earth is a value to be rewarded, and that this metaphysically is the good, then it is here on earth that they will demand their rewards. And suffering, not achievement, will be the claim check to values and the hallmark of virtue. What may obscure the profound viciousness of the altruist morality, the extent to which it is anti-man and anti-life on earth, and for that matter, anti-reality. What may obscure the issue and create confusion about the motives of the advocates of altruism in many people's minds is the historical fact that Christianity was born in a period when men had reason to rebel against the evil, the corruption, and the moral depravity of the degenerate culture of the Roman Empire, and that the early Christians are pictured as gentle, benevolent, courageous human beings, which many of them possibly were. The real issue here is not the personal motives of individual men, but the nature of a mystic philosophy, any mystic philosophy, whether men accepted by mistake or by full conscious intention. If one damns the metaphysical nature of man and of this earth in protest against the evils of a specific culture at a specific time, if one renounces reality altogether and takes refuge in the fantasy of another dimension, the results on earth will carry out all the logical implications of that premise, whether any particular mystic intended it or not. That premise grants metaphysical potency, metaphysical rightness to evil on earth. It implies, for instance, that the evils of the Roman Empire were not created by the depraved choices and standards of men, but were necessitated by the very nature of this earth, that metaphysically evil is the right way and the only way to live, and no other way is possible here on earth. Whether any individual mystic intends it or not, any rebel, any rebel against human evils who escapes into another dimension, takes the easy way out and achieves the opposite of his intention, if love of the good were his intention. He surrenders the earth to evil and joins his voice to that of the emperor or the dictator who proclaims that only evil is practical on earth and that the good has no choice. But mistaken idealistic motives are not the major force that maintain the reign of mysticism and altruism in the world. These two philosophical doctrines are much older than the Judaic Christian tradition. They were the ruling philosophy of all pre-Grecian cultures and of all Oriental cultures. The Orient has never known any other view of life. If altruism were merely a mistaken form of rebellion against the evils of mankind's history, against the terrors, cruelties, and injustices of the Roman emperors, or of feudal lords, or of absolute monarchs, a rebellion motivated purely by compassion for human suffering, it would have vanished in the 19th century. It would have been dropped by all moralists in the face of the Industrial Revolution, and of the American form of government, which were the brilliant, eloquent, irrefutable, practical demonstration of the fact that life on earth is not evil, that terror, violence, and rule by brute force are not the right way to live on earth, that men can achieve an incomparable, undreamed of state of happiness, well-being, prosperity, success, and mutual goodwill, not by sacrifices, but by the rational pursuit of rational values and the 
practice of rational virtues. If the elimination of suffering were the altruist motive, they would have been the first to cheer the industrial revolution, to support a free society, to fight for capitalism. But that is not what happened. What happened was the opposite. It is precisely in the 19th century that the philosophers and moralists of altruism began to create systems for the translation of altruist theories into practice into a political reality on earth. Socialism, communism, Nazism are the philosophical products of the 19th century. It is the altruists who clamored as they clamor today for a return to tyranny, terror, violence, and rule by brute force. It is the altruists who clamored as they clamor today for the enslavement of men. It is the altruists who engineered as they are engineering today the absolutist totalitarian state. And what is the ideal advocated by all collectivist dictatorships? The Garden of Eden, the other dimension, to be made real here on Earth. The effortless universe of guaranteed automatic survival, of unearned rewards and undeserved virtues. The dream world of infinite mediocrities, which was to be reached only through the grave, which was to fulfill the promise that who had been nothing shall be all, and which they now propose to reach through the grave of those who had been something. Mysticism is not a protest against or a consequence of mankind's evils. It is the basic source of most of mankind's evils. It is not an innocent error, but a monstrous fundamental evasion that would make anyone blind to the metaphysical and moral contradictions of altruism, which in essence may be summarized as follows. Why is the earth evil? Because man suffers on earth. What should he do about it? Suffer more. To make men accept the morality of altruism, its advocates have to create or perpetuate in men's souls a state of fear, guilt, or despair. Men who are confident, proud, and happy will not accept the tenet that self-sacrifice is a virtue. Men of self-esteem will not accept the role of sacrificial animals. But men whose basic emotions are fear of dealing with reality, a sense of personal unworthiness, and the state of chronic suffering will accept it. Men who have no self-esteem will not rebel against the role of sacrificial animals. To make men accept the morality of altruism, its advocates have to indoctrinate them with three tenets, which are its three metaphysical pillars that existence is evil, that man is evil, that happiness is evil. You will find these three tenets at the root of every variant of any doctrine that preaches altruism. The attack on existence is always aimed at convincing men that life on earth is nothing but a series of disastrous frustrations, agonies, and that tragedy is man's metaphysical fate. The attack on man is always aimed at convincing men that the mind is impotent and that pride is evil. Observe that in order to make men feel humble, base, worthless, it is the mind that the mystics have to attack, the essential human attribute. The attack on happiness is always aimed at convincing men that they are fundamentally depraved, insensitive, vulgar, gross, or generally inferior if they are capable of experiencing joy. Most people who profess to accept or who pay lip service to the morality of altruism do not understand its actual meaning. Most people believe that it consists of some vague sort of benevolence or kindness toward others, particularly toward those who suffer. 
and that the virtue of sacrifice consists in the fact of giving a dime to a beggar or some such equivalent, and only if one can afford it. But this is not what altruism means, and it is not the kind of result it leads to in practice as the present state of the world can testify. Again quoting from Galt's speech in Emma Shrug, Sacrifice does not mean the rejection of the worthless but of the precious. Sacrifice does not mean the rejection of the evil for the sake of the good, but of the good for the sake of the evil. Sacrifice is the surrender of that which you value in favor of that which you don't. If you exchange a penny for a dollar, it is not a sacrifice. If you exchange a dollar for a penny, it is. If you achieve the career you wanted after years of struggle, it is not a sacrifice. If you then renounce it for the sake of a rival, it is. If you own a bottle of milk and give it to your starving child, it is not a sacrifice. If you give it to your neighbor's child and let your own die, it is." Unquote. There is perhaps more confusion, evasion, and equivocation about the concept of sacrifice than about any other concept. There are three main variants of the definitional sloppiness by means of which the advocates of self-sacrifice try to camouflage the profoundly vicious implications of their own theory. The first such effort consists of defining sacrifice as the surrender of a lower value for the sake of a higher value, with the explanation that one sacrifices values on earth for the sake of higher value beyond the grave in another dimension. If this were the actual meaning of the concept of sacrifice, its advocates would have to restrict its application exclusively to supernatural or theological issues, which is not what they do. The absurdity of that definition applied to issues and choices here on earth is obvious. It would mean that if I am hungry and surrender a dollar of a lower value for the sake of a dinner of a higher value, I am making a sacrifice. Or if I buy a diamond for a sum much lower than its actual value, I am making a sacrifice. Or if I marry the girl I love rather than the girl for whom I feel a mild affection, I am making a sacrifice. This is clearly absurd. When we exchange a lower value for a higher value, we've obtained a profit, not made a sacrifice. The second method of disguising the nature of self-sacrifice is the claim that everything is a sacrifice, that every choice is a sacrifice, that life consists of nothing but sacrifices. For instance, they claim, if I have a dollar and I want to buy both a dinner and a book, each of which costs a dollar, I must sacrifice either one or the other. No matter which I choose, I make a sacrifice. Or if I want to see two movies at the same time, no matter which one I choose, I am sacrificing the other. Or if I want to be a physicist, an economist, a psychologist, an opera singer, a deep sea diver, and a mailman, no matter which career I choose, I must choose it at the cost of sacrificing all the others. The simplest example of an answer to this school of thought is, if I want to have my cake and eat it too, life forces me to sacrifice by forcing me to choose one or the other. This again, I submit, is obviously absurd. A is A, and we cannot have contradictions. Reality confronts us with alternatives, among which we are obliged to choose. We cannot reasonably assert that any choice amounts to a sacrifice. The third method of camouflaging is the claim that nothing is a sacrifice, that there is no such thing as a sacrifice at all. No matter what a man chooses to do, he chooses it because he wants to do it more than he wanted another action, and therefore sacrifice is an illusory, impossible concept. For instance, if a man works all his life in order to support a bunch of mooching relatives who give him nothing in return, he is not sacrificing himself, he just wants to do it. If a man who lives under a dictatorship obeys outrageous demands at the point of a gun, 
he is not being sacrificed, he just wants to do it. This, I think we can readily see, is a little worse than nonsense, it is logically absurd. Sacrifice means the surrender of a higher value to a lower value or to a non-value. That is the only state of affairs which makes sense out of the concept of sacrifice. Now I want to continue our discussion of the practical meaning of this concept. I quote next from Galt's speech in his discussion of the altruist's view of virtue. Quote, If you renounce all personal desires and dedicate your life to those you love, you do not achieve full virtue. You still retain a value of your own, which is your love. If you devote your life to random strangers, it is an act of greater virtue. If you devote your life to serving men you hate, that is the greatest of the virtues you can practice." Unquote. Do you think, perhaps, that Galt exaggerates? I will read you two quotations from the Bible. Quote, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Unquote. And quoting again, quote, And if you lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye, for sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your reward shall be great. And ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil." Unquote. Do you think, perhaps, that this is merely an ancient precept which modern men have outgrown or modified? Do you think that altruism merely preaches kindness, not an actual love for or sacrifice to those whom you have reason to despise? I will read you a passage from Life is Worth Living by Fulton J. Sheen. Commenting on Love Thy Neighbor, Sheen states, quote, The neighbor is the person next door. The neighbor is my other self. The neighbor is a person you meet. The neighbor is the touchstone and test for determining whether I am selfish. Our blessed Lord did not say, love your friends, love those who love you, for there is no reward in that, but love your neighbor. When you women are out shopping, the neighbor is the lady who pulls the dress out of your hands when you want to buy it. When you and someone else run to get a seat on the bus, the other person is the neighbor. When you are driving in Sunday traffic, the one who cuts left from the far lane is your neighbor. The neighbor is the one who steps on your toes in the subway. The neighbor is the one who comes to a meeting or conference with you, is very nice to your face, but when the meeting is over, runs a knife into your back. Unquote. Virtue, according to the altruists, consists of loving the person who runs a knife into your back. He did not have to be virtuous and love you. You become virtuous by loving him for his lack of virtue. You are loyal to your values by loving him for the fact that he does not share your values, the value of your own life included. I quote from Galt's speech, quote, a sacrifice is the surrender of a value. Full sacrifice is full surrender of all values. If you wish to achieve full virtue, you must seek no gratitude in return for your sacrifice, no praise, no love, no admiration, no self-esteem, not even the pride of being virtuous. The faintest trace of any gain dilutes your virtue. If you pursue a course of action that does not taint your life by any joy, that brings you no value in matter, no value in spirit, no gain, no profit, no reward, 
If you achieve this state of total zero, you have achieved the ideal of moral perfection. Unquote. Do you think that this is an exaggeration? I will read a passage from Immanuel Kant, from Kant's Fundamental Principles of the Metaphysics of Morals. Quote, it is a duty to maintain one's life, and, in addition, everyone has also a direct inclination to do so. But on this account, the often anxious care which most men take for it has no intrinsic worth, and their maxim has no moral import. They preserve their life as duty requires, no doubt, but not because duty requires. On the other hand, if adversity and hopeless sorrow have completely taken away the relish for life, if the unfortunate or dejected wishes for death and yet preserves his life without loving it, not from inclination or fear but from duty, then his maxim has a moral worth." Unquote. Now I will read an excerpt from an article in Time magazine of April 11, 1955, dealing with present-day nuns and convents, quote, The contemplative convent is far more than a quiet place to provide the opportunity for prayer. It is also a kind of operating room where prolonged and drastic surgery takes place to free the individual from those things that stand between her and the love of God. There are three main areas to be operated upon, represented by the vows. The vow of poverty, designed to cut through the hampering entanglement of material things, operates on many levels. Carmelites and some other religious are forbidden to use the word my except for their faults. They refer to our cell, our brevery. Poverty applies equally to any kind of attachment. Sisters are systematically frustrated by their superiors in the tendency to become identified with a particular job or hobby. Still more strictly applied, the vow of poverty applies also to impressions. Contemplatives are actually enjoined to see and hear as little as possible of what goes on around them. The vow of chastity is the easiest to fulfill for most religious. Hardest is the vow of obedience, designed to eliminate the most formidable barrier between the human and divine, the self. Obedience to the superior is looked upon by the monastic as obedience to the will of God, much as the soldier is trained to salute, not the officer, but the uniform of his country. The superior deliberately imposes humiliations to break the natural self-love most lay Christians take as a matter of course." Unquote. I have said that to make men accept the morality of altruism, the altruist had to destroy man's self-esteem, to wipe out any trace of pride he might possess. Let us see how this morality, which purports to be a code of love for mankind, treats man. I will read to you a passage from a collection entitled Essays in Philosophy, in which the ideas of Calvin are summarized. Quote, man should have not only the conviction of his absolute nothingness, but he should do everything to humiliate him. For I do not call it humility, says Calvin, if you suppose that we have anything left. We cannot think of ourselves as we ought to think without utterly despising everything that may be supposed an excellence in us. This humility is unfeigned submission of a mind overwhelmed with a weighty sense of its own misery and poverty. For such is the uniform description of it in the Word of God. If the individual finds something on the strength of which he finds pleasure in himself, he betrays this sinful self-love. This fondness for himself will make him sit in judgment over others and despise them. 
Therefore, to be fond of oneself or to like anything in oneself is one of the greatest sins." Unquote. Observe the significant sentence which gives away the deepest fear and the hidden motivation. Again, quoting, this fondness for himself will make him sit in judgment over others and despise them, unquote. Translate this into its actual existential meaning. No matter what virtue or greatness a man achieves in his life and his character, he, again quoting, should have not only the conviction of his absolute nothingness, but he should do everything to humiliate himself, unquote in order that human swine would not have to fear that he will sit in judgment over them and despise them as they deserve to be despised. Now I want to remind you of a scene between James Taggart and Cheryl which will give you a concrete example of who are to be the moral profiteers on man's humiliation. Cheryl asks Taggart why he dislikes his sister and he answers because she thinks she's so good. What right has she to think it? What right has anybody to think he's good? Nobody's any good. You don't mean it, Mr. Taggart. I mean, we're only human beings, and what's a human being? A weak, ugly, sinful creature, born that way, rotten in his bones. So humility is the one virtue he ought to practice. He ought to spend his life on his knees, begging to be forgiven for his dirty existence. When a man thinks he's good, that's when he's rotten. Pride is the worst of all sins, no matter what he's done. But if a man knows that what he's done is good, then he ought to apologize for it. To whom? To those who haven't done it." Unquote. Do you think that James Taggart goes too far and that no moralist could possibly agree with him? I will read to you a statement of Reinhold Niebuhr as quoted in A Modern Introduction to Ethics, edited by Milton Munitz. Quote, Pride is the form of egoism which corrupts the spirits of all those who possess some excellency of knowledge or achievement, which distinguishes them from the crowd so that they forget their common humanity and their equal unworthiness in the sight of God." Unquote. According to this moralist's view of justice and of virtue, John Galt, Hank Reardon, Dagny Taggart, and James Taggart are all equally unworthy in the sight of God. If anyone should raise a voice in defense of the reality of human virtues, the altruists will dismiss it with a mental shrug, expressing in effect the sentence, who can bother weighing virtues in the midst of a catastrophe, and will answer with that mixture of panic and sweetness, which is their particular attribute. Panic and sweetness are not an attractive mixture, as witness the following quotation from A Free Man's Worship by Bertrand Russell. Quote, the life of man is a long march through the night, surrounded by invisible foes, tortured by weariness and pain towards a goal that few can hope to reach and where none may tarry long. One by one, as they march, our comrades vanish from our sight, seized by the silent orders of omnipotent death. Very brief is the time in which we can help them, in which their happiness or misery is decided. Be it ours to shed sunshine on their path, to lighten their sorrows by the balm of sympathy, to give them the pure joy of a never-tiring affection, to strengthen failing courage, to instill faith in hours of despair. Let us not weigh in grudging scales their merits and demerits, but let us think only of their need, of the sorrows, the difficulties, perhaps the blindnesses that make the misery of their lives. Let us remember that they are fellow sufferers, the same darkness, 
actors in the same tragedy with ourselves, unquote. Now, I want to show you something interesting about the ethics of altruism. You know, if one is advocating a moral position which is objectively valid or which one believes to be objectively valid, then one should be unhesitatingly willing to express it in the first person, the second person, or the third person. Thus, as an objectivist, I can say, I should live for my own rational self-interest. You should, man should, he should, we should. And nothing embarrassing happens to me if I alter the person which I use. Now, let's apply that method to the Russell quotation. I'm going to simply go over it again, this time putting it in the first person. My life is a long march through the night, surrounded by invisible foes, tortured by weariness and pain, toward a goal I can scarcely hope to reach and where I may not tarry long. One by one as I march, my comrades vanish from my sight, seized by the silent orders of omnipotent death. Very brief is the time in which you can help me in which my happiness or misery is decided. Be it yours to shed sunshine on my path, to lighten my sorrows by the balm of sympathy, to give me the pure joy of a never-tiring affection, to strengthen my failing courage, to instill faith in my hours of despair. Do not weigh in grudging scales my merits Think only of my need, of my sorrows, my difficulties, perhaps my blindnesses that make the misery of my life. Remember that you are fellow sufferers of the same darkness, actors in the same tragedy with myself. It doesn't sound as good this way, does it? Well, that's something I will leave you to ponder the implications of. The code of self-sacrifice is both immoral and impractical. It is immoral because it demands the sacrifice of the good to the evil. It is impractical because it results in nothing but pain and destruction. The irrational is not to be had. There is no way to make evil work, no way to make it practical, regardless of the willingness of the victims. When men act against the standard of reason and life, suffering and death is all reality will permit them to achieve. If an employer sacrifices himself for his workers, if he decides to pay them more than they are worth, distributes all his profits and wages and promptly goes bankrupt and has to close his business, who has gained by his sacrifice? If a son sacrifices himself for his mother, if he gives up the career he wanted and chooses a career of her preference instead, a career he hates, and then proceeds to loathe his work, his mother, and himself, who has gained by his sacrifice? If a man of reason sacrifices his independent judgment, for the sake of catering to the self-delusion of a fool whose feelings he doesn't want to hurt. If he lies to the fool, pretends agreement with the fool's beliefs, and encourages the fool to depart still further from reality until he crashes in total destruction, who has gained by the sacrifice? Human brotherhood and social harmony are the favorite slogans, goals, and promises of all the mystic, altruist, collectivist, moralists. They have been preaching it for centuries, but the closer they come to the full practice of their morality, the farther they move from the realization of these goals. The fact is that no brotherhood or harmony is possible to men under the morality of altruism. 
One cannot achieve brotherhood or harmony or security or goodwill by a system which destroys one man for the benefit of another, who in turn is destroyed for the benefit of somebody else, who in turn is destroyed for the benefit of the next, and so on. Death destruction, terror, and hatred of all for all is the only state one can achieve. And as you can see all around you, that is what men are achieving today. It is specifically this creed which objectivism challenges down to the root. The notion which has dominated mankind's history in one form or another virtually from the beginning. The doctrine that man has no right to exist for his own sake. All the ethical systems that achieved any degree of world influence were at root variations on the theme of self-sacrifice. Unselfishness was equated with virtue, selfishness was made a synonym of evil. In such systems, man has always been the victim, twisted against himself and commanded to be unselfish, in sacrificial service to some allegedly higher value called God, or Pharaoh, or Emperor, or King, or society, or the state, or the race. Or the proletariat. It was a 19th century advocate of collectivism and totalitarianism, Auguste Comte, who coined the term that names the essence of this concept of morality. It was he who coined the term altruism. Today the average man often takes altruism to mean simply benevolence or kindness or respect for the rights of others. But that is not the meaning Comte intended, and that is not the term's actual philosophical meaning. Altruism, as an ethical principle, holds that man must make the welfare of others his primary moral concern, and must place their interests above his own. It holds that man has no right to exist for his own sake, that service to others is the moral justification of his existence that self-sacrifice is his foremost duty and highest virtue. It is a curious paradox of human history that this doctrine, which tells man that he is to regard himself as a sacrificial animal, has been accepted as a doctrine representing benevolence and love for mankind. One need only consider the consequences to which this doctrine has led to estimate the nature of its benevolence. From the first individual thousands of years ago, who was sacrificed on an altar for the good of the tribe, to the heretics and dissenters burned at the stake for the good of the populace, for the glory of God, to the millions exterminated in gas chambers or slave labor camps, for the good of the race or of the proletariat, it is this morality that has served as justification for every dictatorship and every atrocity, past or present. Yet, men fought only over particular applications of this morality. They fought over who should be sacrificed to whom and for whose benefit. They expressed horror and indignation when they did not approve of someone's particular choice of victims and beneficiaries. But they did not question that man is an object of sacrifice. The majority of men do not, of course, attempt to practice the doctrine of altruism consistently in their everyday lives. By its nature, that would not be possible. It is not a code to live by, only to die by. But because men have accepted it as right, because they view altruism and morality as, as synonyms, they are left in a moral vacuum. They have no moral principles to guide their choices and actions in practical reality. 
In their human relationships, they do not know what demands they can permit themselves and what demands they must grant to others. They do not know what is theirs by right, what is theirs by favor, what is theirs by someone's sacrifice. They fluctuate between sacrificing themselves to others and sacrificing others to themselves, under the guidance of conflicting social pressures and conflicting subjective whims, in no case feeling in rational control of their lives. They are forced into the position of amoralists, not by desire, but by default. The door to morality has been closed by a doctor that offers them self-immolation as a moral ideal. Now what are the social consequences of the doctrine of altruism? I have already indicated that altruism is in effect the moral base of every type of dictatorship we have known in history. Let me quote from Benito Mussolini in this connection, quote, The world seen through fascism is not this material world which appears on the surface, in which man is an individual separated from all others and standing by himself. The man of fascism is an individual who is nation and fatherland, which is a moral law binding together individuals and the generations into a tradition and a mission, suppressing the instinct for a life enclosed within the brief round of pleasure in order to restore within duty a higher life free from the limits of time and space, a life in which the individual, through the denial of himself, through the sacrifice of his own private interests, through death itself, realizes that completely spiritual existence in which his value as a man lies. And again, to quote Joseph Goebbels, quote, to be a socialist is to submit the I to the thou. Socialism is sacrificing the individual to the whole, unquote. And, declares Adolf Hitler, quote, in the hunt for their own happiness, people fall all the more out of heaven into hell." Unquote. As to communism, its connection to the altruist morality is too obvious and too well known to require lengthy discussion. The sacrifice of the individual to the collective, the renunciation of all personal interests and motives, the individual service to society as the sole justification of his existence, society's right to sacrifice him at any moment in any manner it pleases for the sake of any social goal. This is the essence of communism. From each according to his abilities to each according to his needs is the altruist collective slogan picked up from antiquity and introduced into modern culture by Karl Marx. Quote, in a country where the sole employer is the state, writes Leon Trotsky with uncharacteristic candor, opposition means death by slow starvation. The old principle, who does not work shall not eat, has been replaced by a new one, who does not obey shall not eat." Unquote. When, during his visit to the United States in 1959, Khrushchev declared in effect that communism merely puts into practice the precepts of the Bible, he revealed a better grasp of ethical principles than those who listened to him, aghast. I'd like to conclude this discussion with one story that I think is very eloquent as to the profound social, political, consequences of men's blindness concerning the meaning of altruism. I quote from a news story which appeared in Time magazine on July 29, 1957. Quote, recalling his tortuous post-war discussions with Zhukov, a, inside quote, confirmed communist but an honest man, close inside quote, Dwight Eisenhower went on, 
now quote in Eisenhower. One evening we had a three hour conversation. We tried each to explain to the other just what our system meant to the individual. And I was very hard put to it when he insisted that their system appealed to the idealistic and we completely to the materialistic. And I had a very tough time trying to defend our position because he said, you tell a person he can do as he pleases, he can act as he pleases, he can do anything. Everything that is selfish in man, you appeal to him, and we tell him that he must sacrifice for the state. Asked by the New York Times, James Reston, if he meant to imply that democracy was more difficult to defend than communism, the president patiently explained, look, Mr. Reston, I think you could run into people you have a hard time convincing that the sun is hot and the earth is round. Against that kind of belief, you run against arguments that almost leave you breathless. You don't know how to meet them." Unquote. Clearly, this is not an answer, but an evasion. Eisenhower did not know how to meet Zhukov's arguments. Such is the moral chaos to which the ethics of altruism has led. The president of the greatest noblest, freest country on earth has no moral defense to offer against the bloodiest dictatorship in history, whose representative proudly boasts of his country's moral superiority. And by the standards of altruism, Zhukov is right. Now, perhaps you understand a little clearer why the issue of altruism versus rational self-interest or rational egoism is a fight in which the stakes are life and death itself, in which the stakes are the future of the civilized free world. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we shall take up the application of the principles of the objectivist ethics to the science of politics, to the organization of a rational society, to the nature and functions of government, to the relationship between government and the individual. I shall begin by asking you to consider why do men live in society? Why do individuals not retire with their chosen friends to an isolated self-sustaining farm? What are the advantages that men gain from living and dealing with one another? You will often hear it claimed by the preachers of an altruist morality that men need one another and that therefore they must be willing to sacrifice for one another and not live selfishly. Before one can speak about what man does or does not need, it is necessary to define what is meant by the concept need. The concept of need in this context, that is, as applied to a living organism, means that which the organism requires for its survival and well-being. Thus, we can say that man has a need of food, a need by what standard? by the standard of survival. We can say that man has a need of self-esteem, again by the standard of survival. All of man's needs, the needs of his body or of his mind, are determined, of course, by his specific nature. Do men have a need for one another? Yes, under certain specific circumstances and conditions. The exact nature and meaning of this need requires precise identification, however. Let me first point out that under no circumstances could man's need of other men serve as a valid justification for the doctrine of self-sacrifice. In the claim of the altruists, there is an inherent contradiction. Insofar as man needs others, he needs them for selfish purposes. His self-interest is the standard that determines what are his needs. And to assert that his self-interest can require his self-destruction is blatantly absurd. 
survival cannot demand self-extinction. Self-sacrifice cannot be a practical necessity of life. Man's life cannot demand the surrender of his life. The achievement of his values cannot necessitate the renunciation of his values. The cost of self-fulfillment cannot be self-immolation. Now let us proceed to analyze in what way living in society can contribute to the survival of an individual. An understanding of this issue is essential in order to arrive at a valid theory of politics. The first great value that men can offer one another is the exchange of knowledge. For a man to achieve a form of life significantly above that of an animal, he requires a complexity of knowledge that he could not discover single-handedly in one lifetime. Man is the one species that has the power to transmit knowledge and to pass it on from generation to generation thus multiplying incalculably the potential of all those men who come after him. And at any given time, in any given society, men who specialize in different fields of knowledge can exchange their discoveries with others, thereby raising the intellectual productivity of all, or of all who care to think. We who live today can, simply by looking around us, observe the consequences of the tremendous intellectual heritage we now possess. And we can appreciate what a distance has been covered since, figuratively speaking, the first man thousands of years ago connected the first thought and learned to communicate it to the men around him. The development of language was, of course, the crucial discovery making possible the transmission of knowledge from man to man and from generation to generation. This emphatically does not mean, as you will hear it claimed by some psychologists and sociologists, that it is society that made man human. Such theorists maintain that without society, man is an animal. But apes also live in societies. This has not turned them into human beings. The mere fact of communal living will not endow man with the power to think, which is the distinctly human faculty. That potentiality had to exist in man in order for him to be able to profit from dealing with others, to grasp and make use of the knowledge they offered. If this were not so, there would be no way to explain how the first knowledge was discovered. Rational men can raise one another's intellectual and productive potential. They can contribute to the efficacy and fruitfulness of one another's thinking, but they cannot convert the non-human into the human. They cannot convert an ape into a man. I might add parenthetically that certain philosophers have done their best and have come remarkably close to turning men into apes. Without minimizing the tremendous advantage that social living can afford, we must not forget that this advantage is possible only because man has the power to reason, to conceptualize and that he can make use of the knowledge of others only to the extent that he does choose to exercise that faculty. In addition to the exchange of knowledge, men can profit enormously from the division of labor and from the exchange of the products of labor. The details of this process will be taken up in our discussion of economics, but for the moment let me point out that which all of us can readily perceive. By means of the specialization of labor and the exchange of goods and services, a mode of existence is possible to us that clearly would not be possible if we had to work alone on the desert island or a self-sustaining farm, producing everything one needed single-handedly, making one's own shoes, growing one's own food, building one's own shelter, and so forth. 
The properly self-supporting man produces the value equivalent of what he consumes. But if he lives in a trade society, he is able to specialize in a single line of work, to grow increasingly efficient and increasingly productive because he specializes, and to exchange the intellectual or physical results of his labor with other productive men in other lines of specialization. But observe that if these are the two crucial advantages which man gains from living in society, his need of the society is not unconditional. It depends on specific conditions being fulfilled. Men can contribute to one another's survival only to the extent that they have something of value to trade, only to the extent that they are rational and productive. For instance, if you lived in a society of mystics, of men who, to put it in an exaggerated form, never thought, never reasoned, never consulted anything but their feelings and revelations, no exchange of knowledge would be possible. Do you need, is your survival enhanced by, men who think? Yes. Do you need, is your survival enhanced by, men who refuse to think? No. They have nothing of value to offer you. By the same principle, you have need of, meaning your survival is enhanced by, men who produce men who have objective values to offer you in exchange for the things you have produced. But you certainly do not need men who produce nothing. You certainly do not need men who attack you and feed off you as parasites, offering no value in exchange for that which they take. Is your survival enhanced by living among Hank Reardon's? Yes. Is it enhanced by living among looters, robbers, criminals? Clearly not. You profit from dealing with producers. You do not profit by dealing with destroyers. You profit from Hank Reardon. You do not profit from Al Capone. Living in society, then, is a value only to the extent that men deal with you by reason and through productive trade. To the extent to which you are surrounded by men who instead deal with you by blind emotion, by irrationalism, and by physical force or fraud, your interests are not only not served, they are negated and sacrificed. If your choice is between a desert island and a concentration camp, a desert island is preferable. If your choice is between a self-sustaining farm and a New York City run by an absolute dictator, the self-sustaining farm is preferable. One cannot justify the existence of a slave society on the grounds that we all need one another. No one needs torture, expropriation and death. So that when one is considering the issue of man's role in society, the thing that must never be forgotten is why man chooses to live in society, what are the advantages of so doing, and at what point those advantages become nullified and negated. Now with this understood, let us proceed. When men enter into social relationships, when they choose to deal with one another, they face a fundamental alternative, to deal with one another by means of reason or by means of force. Reason and force are opposites. Either a man seeks to gain values from others by their voluntary consent, by appealing to their mind, or he seeks to gain values without the voluntary consent of the owners, that is, by coercion or fraud. 
This alternative, ladies and gentlemen, is the issue at the base of all social relationships and all political systems. Every use of force is the attempt to compel a man to act against his own judgment. If he were willing to take the action voluntarily, force would not be required. It is at the mind that any gun is aimed. The choice to deal with men by persuasion implies that they, like you, must live and act by the judgment of their own mind. That every man is the owner of his own life and person, and that he is not a means to your end as you are not a means to his. That man must properly act in the name of his own self-interest. That this is what his life requires, and you recognize it. And that if you wish to gain a value from other men, you must offer a value in exchange, be it a logical argument, a service, or a material commodity. The choice to deal with men by force implies your rejection of reason as man's means of survival, your confession of intellectual bankruptcy, your admission that you have no values to offer by means of which you could win your victim's voluntary consent, your belief that men are sacrificial animals whose minds, lives, and property are yours to command and loot. When you resort to the use of force to gain the values you desire, it is yourself that you reduce to the state of an animal. You declare that you are a wild beast who is no longer to be treated or regarded as a rational being. This leads us to a very important statement in Galt's speech in Atlas Shrugged, from which I now quote. So long as men desire to live together, no man may initiate, do you hear me? No man may start the use of physical force against others. To interpose the threat of physical destruction between a man and his perception of reality is to negate and paralyze his means of survival. To force him to act against his own judgment is like forcing him to act against his own sight. Whoever, to whatever purpose or extent, initiates the use of force is a killer acting on the premise of death in a manner wider than murder the premise of destroying man's capacity to live. To force a man to drop his own mind and to accept your will as a substitute, with a gun in place of a syllogism, with terror in place of proof, and death as the final argument, is to attempt to exist in defiance of reality. Reality demands of man that he act for his own rational interest. Your gun demands of him that he act against it. Reality threatens man with death if he does not act on his rational judgment. You threaten him with death if he does. You place him into a world where the price of his life is the surrender of all the virtues required by life. And death by a process of gradual destruction is all that you and your system achieve when death is made to be the ruling power, the winning argument, in a society of men." Unquote. This is the most basic principle at the root of the objectivist political theory. No man or group of men may initiate the use of force against others. No man or group of men may seek to gain values from others by the initiation of physical force. There is only one circumstance under which the use of force is morally permissible, as retaliation against the person or persons who initiated its use. 
To start the use of force is evil. To protect oneself against it is not. This is the principle that differentiates murder from self-defense. This distinction is crucial and must be clearly understood. When a man picks up a gun, he announces that he cannot be dealt with by reason. If his victims answer him by force, they merely take him at his word and treat him as he has asked. The man who initiates the use of force does so in order to gain a value. But when a man uses force in retaliation or self-defense, his motive is not to gain a value, but to keep a value that is rightfully his. A rational man does not seek rewards by means of the evil, but neither does he willingly surrender his values to evil. The man who wishes to survive by means of force seeks to live by a double standard. He necessarily is counting on the existence of men who live not by force but by production. Men who will create that which he intends to loot. If there were no people who function by reason, there would be nothing for the men of force to expropriate. Force is only a tool of destruction. It is not a tool of creation. Force can negate, but it cannot achieve. It can forbid thought, but it cannot replace it. If there is one infallible test of self-contempt, it is a person's willingness to live under force. His willingness to accept as a moral principle that others have the right to dictate his thoughts and his actions. His willingness to submit his mind and his life to the arbitrary power of a gun. A man who submits to force when he has no choice is not immoral, provided he identifies his plight as evil. But the man who considers it moral, considers it right that others should force him deserves what he gets. And in the world of today, he is getting it. A social or political system is a code of principles that men observe in order to live together. The political expression of the principle that no man may initiate the use of force against other human beings is the concept of rights. Observe that the question of rights would not arise on a desert island. Such a question as, does man have the right to his life, his freedom, and his property, would not and could not arise if there were no other human beings potentially capable of depriving him of these possessions. It is for this reason that Ms. Rand defines a right as a moral principle defining man's freedom of action in a social context. Observe that the word right itself is a moral term. In political usage, it pertains to a sanction for certain actions, but it has a wider moral usage as when we speak of things as right or wrong. Man's basic right, the right from which all other rights derive, is the right to life. This means the right to act in the manner which man's life requires, the right to think and to translate one's thought into action. Why does man possess this right? Because it is a necessity of survival. Quoting Galt's speech, Quote, rights are conditions of existence required by man's nature for man's proper survival. If man is to live on earth, it is right for him to use his mind. It is right to act on his own free judgment. It is right to work for his values and to keep the product of his work. If life on earth is his purpose, he has a right to live as a rational being. Nature forbids him the irrational. Any group, 
any gang, any nation that attempts to negate man's rights is wrong, which means is evil, which means is anti-life, unquote. It is not thus that rights traditionally have been conceived. Insofar as rights have been defended in the past, they have been upheld usually to be a gift either from God or else a gift from society. It has been argued that since man's life belongs to God, other men must not harm him or enslave him. I do not have to tell you what is wrong with such an argument. To tie rights to God is to build one's entire political philosophy on an arbitrary mystical base, a base that no man of reason will accept. To tie rights to mysticism is to declare that there is no rational justification for them, no rational reason why men should not murder and enslave one another. A political system that has nothing better to offer as sanction for its precepts than the authority of a supernatural ghost is doomed from the start. To claim that man's rights are a gift from society is to assert that man exists not by right, but by permission. Rights are a moral concept. Man possesses them by his nature as man, or he does not possess them at all. That which society gives, society can take away. A permission can be revoked. If your life and freedom are a gift from society, this means that you are the property of society. Again, quoting Galt, quote, The source of rights is not divine law or congressional law, but the law of identity. A is A, and man is man. Rights are conditions of existence required by man's nature for his proper survival. Close quote. All of man's other rights, the right of liberty, of property, of the pursuit of happiness, are contained in, implied, and necessitated by the right of life. The right to life means the right to think and to act on one's own judgment, which is the right of liberty. It means the right to work for the achievement of one's values and to keep the results, which is the right of property. It means the right to live for one's own sake, to choose and to work for one's own selfish goals, which is the right to the pursuit of happiness. The rights of life, liberty, property, and happiness are logically indivisible. To affirm any of these rights is to affirm them all. To negate, to deny any of these rights is to negate or deny them all. I want to point out that without the right of property, no other rights are possible. The right of property is the right to the use and disposal of that which one has produced. If one is not free to use that which one has produced, one does not possess the right of liberty. If one is not free to make the products of one's work serve one's chosen goals, one does not possess the right to the pursuit of happiness. And since man is not a ghost who exists in some non-material manner, if one is not free to keep and to consume the products of one's work, one does not possess the right of life. The concept of rights, and this is very important to understand, the concept of rights pertains to action. The right of life does not mean that somebody owes it to you to keep you alive. It does not mean that if you starve to death because you refuse to work, your right to live has been violated. The right of life means your right to take the actions which your survival requires, free from coercion and interference by other men. It means that you have the right to achieve and maintain your life and that no one has the right to deprive you of your life. Similarly, the right of property does not mean that someone owes you property. 
It means your right to keep and use that which you have produced. Man's rights are inalienable, which means they are his by nature and by objective moral principle. A society's choice is not whether or not it will grant man's rights, but only whether or not it will choose to acknowledge that he possesses them. Rights can be violated, but they cannot be destroyed. If you murder a man, you do not alienate his right to life. The right is with him. You are wrong. You can take away a man's life, but you cannot take away his right to life. Remember that rights are a moral concept and that moral issues are always a matter of choice. An individual or a government is factually free to refuse to recognize man's rights and to function on the policy of a criminal. But they are not free to escape the consequences. If they pursue a course that is anti-life, death and destruction is all they will achieve, as they are achieving it in most of the world today. The practical form in which one acknowledges the rights of others in action is the commitment to deal with them only by their voluntary consent. There is only one way in which rights can be violated by the use of physical force. Fraud is an indirect form of force. Both consist of obtaining from a man that which he is not willing to give voluntarily. In a free society, you may do whatever you wish, provided you do not violate the rights of other men. This, let me stress, is not a limitation on your freedom. If men do not possess rights, you can make no moral claim to the right of freedom. If they do possess rights, you cannot claim that your rights consist of violating the rights of another. You cannot claim the right to a contradiction. The concept of rights, I submit, must lie at the foundation of any moral society. The alternative is a society of criminals and dictators. To reject the concept of rights is to reject the morality of life from which they are derived and to function implicitly on the morality of death. The proof of this statement can be found in any daily newspaper. You will see there the consequences of rejecting rights written in blood across most of the continents of the world. A concentration camp is a monument to the belief that the good of the collective, of the state, or of society supersedes the rights of the individual. And this leads us to the issue of what is government and what is the relationship of government to the individual. A government is a social agency that performs the task of formulating and enforcing the laws of a country. A country in this context is a geographical territory inhabited by men who observe a common code of laws administered by a single government. A law in this context is a rule of action pertaining to the relationships of men inhabiting the same country. Exclusive jurisdiction over a geographical territory is a primary attribute of a government. A tribe of nomads that has no fixed habitation, such as the gypsies, may have tribal rulers, but these do not constitute a government. A group of people who share certain principles or beliefs but are separated in various parts of the world, such as the Catholic Church, may have a central agency that prescribes to them certain rules of action, but this is not a government. The Gypsies, or the Catholics, or any other private organization of men, 
have to abide by the public laws of whatever country they live in. The distinguishing attributes of a government are a. Exclusive jurisdiction over a geographical territory where its laws apply to all inhabitants and b. A monopoly on the use of physical force within that territory. For instance, if the rulers of a gypsy tribe decided to punish some member who had broken their laws by executing him, the laws of the United States would not permit it. Such rulers would be arrested and tried for murder. Or if they decided to punish him by locking him in a private jail of their own, they would not be able to enforce their verdict in that the prisoner could escape and appeal to the United States government, which would protect him. In any country and under any political system, the right to enforce its laws by the actual use of physical force belongs exclusively to the government. This is the most important difference between a government and a private organization. Why do men need a government? The willingness to subscribe to a common set of rules or a common set of principles is a precondition of any association of human beings. If men choose to live together and or to deal with one another, they have to agree to observe certain rules of conduct, or no action, cooperation, or dealings of any kind will be possible among them. Before a man can deal with others, he has to know what he may or may not do to them, and what they may or may not do to him. There is no other way for men to live or deal with one another safely and effectively. Let's take a few simple examples. Suppose that a group of men agree on a common set of rules and start on a common undertaking, but come to a disagreement on some specific point. Now their only recourse in such case is to appeal to an arbiter, an umpire, a judge, and to abide by his decision, if they wish to go on with their undertaking. If they can find no common principle by which to choose a judge or reconcile their differences, and assuming there is no question of a government being involved, they have to resort to physical force to fight one another till one side or both sides are destroyed. There is no other means to settle disputes. Or again, suppose that one man in such a group decides to act on his arbitrary whim to break the common agreement, seize the property of others, and escape. Again, the others have to resort to force. They have to organize a common defense. They have to pursue him, reclaim their property, and make it impossible for him to injure them in the future. Again, assuming there is no government involved. Since men cannot survive by means of brute force, since they cannot produce nor prosper nor plan a step if their plans are at the mercy of brute force unleashed against them by anyone's personal or arbitrary whim, their need to live under a rule of law is the reason why they need a government. A rule of law is a rule by objective principles, which are understood in advance observed by all, and enforced on lawbreakers when necessary. It may sound ironic when one considers the extent to which most governments in history have inverted, perverted, and corrupted their function. But men need a government for the purpose of protecting them from physical force and arbitrary whim, and of upholding objective principles of proper action. What principles of action are proper for men is a question to be answered by the science of morality. This is the reason why every political theory is based on a moral theory, and every form of government is based on some moral code accepted by the citizens of a country, explicitly or implicitly, by conscious choice or by tradition or by default. If throughout history most governments have acted on principles diametrically opposed to their proper function and their only moral justification, 
If instead of protecting men from physical force and arbitrary whim, governments have been the initiators of physical force and arbitrary whim, if instead of acting as men's defenders, governments have acted as men's oppressors, look for the cause of it in the kind of moralities that men have accepted. An inverted morality, a morality which penalizes the good and rewards the evil, will result in inverted actions and inverted human institutions. A non-objective morality will result in non-objective laws. A morality that regards men as sacrificial animals will result in a government whose purpose is to enforce the sacrificing. Observe that even the worst, the most tyrannical, and the most brutal governments have always had to maintain the pretense of some sort of moral sanction for their tyranny. The rulers of primitive cultures have had to have the sanction of religion in order to give their subjects a moral reason for obeying their edicts at a time when morality was the exclusive monopoly of religion. Thus, the pharaohs of Egypt were considered to be gods supernatural beings destined to rule plain mortals. The absolute monarchs of the post-Renaissance period in Europe had to have the mystical sanction of the doctrine of the divine right of kings. The Soviet dictators spent an incalculable amount of time, money, and effort on propaganda, assuring their victims that their dictatorship is sanctioned by the historically preordained mission of the proletariat and that they, the dictators, are merely the proletariat's humble servants. The Nazi dictators did the same, with the sole difference that the historically preordained mission was changed to the biologically preordained mission of the Aryan race, which Hitler was ordered to serve by a personal message from the god Wotan. No matter to what grotesquely irrational nonsense a gangster government has to resort in order to justify itself, the significant fact is that no government has ever been able to use brute force as its own justification. Men cannot be enslaved merely by physical force, at least not for long. They have to be disarmed by means of a corrupt morality by means of their vague, unverbalized, unidentified sense that there is some reason why they need to live under some sort of law and order. Now, as we have discussed in preceding lectures, the fundamental difference among moral codes rests on a single issue which may be summarized in this way. Is it a morality of life or of death? Does it reflect and proceed from the recognition of man's right to exist, or does it implicitly or explicitly deny that right? Now, the same difference applies to all political theories, since all of them are based on one kind of morality or another. The fundamental principle or the root of any political theory, the principle which determines its entire content, is its answer to a single question. Does man possess inalienable individual rights, or does he not? The rest is merely a difference of details, names, tags, slogans, and victims. It is a crucial difference, morally, politically, and practically, whether men live or die. It makes no difference whatever who claims the right to kill them. It is a crucial difference whether men are free or enslaved. It makes no difference whatever who claims the right to enslave them. And in spite of all the volumes of endless verbiage written by the various theorists of political slavery, the results of their allegedly different theories have been totally alike in practice. In all of history, there have been only three distinct political theories, if one considers them not in terms of superficial differences, but in terms of their essential fundamental principle. And I will call these three theories anarchism, statism, and constitutionalism. Or again, no government, unlimited government, government limited by individual rights. Now, anarchism, strictly speaking, is not a political theory, but a rejection of political theory. 
Anarchism claims that men need no government, no political system, and that any man should be free to do anything he pleases in relation to other men. Although most advocates of anarchism would deny it, since most of them have professed altruism, the logical base of their political theory is the morality of hedonism, the doctrine that there are no objective moral standards and that a man's pleasure, his wishes, feelings, desires, or whims is the only standard of value in action. Statism includes all the political theories which claim that man has no rights, that the state holds absolute power and may do anything it pleases. All statist theories rest on the collectivist altruist principle, on the doctrine that man's life belongs to others, to some authority higher than himself, which is either God or society, and that whoever is the representative of God or of society may dispose of a man's life in any way he chooses, for the sake, benefit, and welfare of that higher authority. Thus, in a status theory, the power of the government is unlimited. There are no individual rights to oppose or restrict it. The government is absolute, omnipotent, totalitarian. The variants of the statist political theory are monarchism, socialism, communism, fascism, Nazism, and democracy. Don't be surprised by this last. The word democracy has been so misused today that, like the word liberal, it has lost all meaning and is now a rubber term which can mean anything to anyone and therefore is no longer a part of articulate communicable language. That which can mean anything means nothing. But in its original use, in political theory, democracy meant unlimited majority rule and was the name of a political theory which claimed that man has no individual rights, that the people, by a majority vote, may do anything it pleases, and that anything done by a majority is right because it is done by a majority, numbers being the only standard of right or wrong. Democracy is simply mob rule, and the best example of it in practice is a lynching mob. Historically, democracy could be practiced only in small communities and was practiced in the city-states of ancient Greece, where the people, or those who had the privileges of full citizenship, could get together at a meeting and vote on various issues without the intermediary of elected representatives. A classic example of democracy in action is the death of Socrates. As you may recall, Socrates was sentenced to death by a vote of his fellow Athenians, who considered him dangerous to the morals of the youth of Athens. And although he had an opportunity to escape, he refused to do so, stating that his fellow citizens were wrong in their judgment, but that he recognized their right to dispose of his life if they so voted. This is the moral and political meaning of democracy. The United States, of course, is a constitutional republic. And this brings us to the third political theory, which, to coin the term, in effect, I will call constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is the political theory that holds that man has inalienable individual rights which may not be violated by others, that the only purpose of a government is to protect individual rights, man's individual rights, that the power of government is limited by these rights, which the government may not suspend, infringe, break, or violate, that the government as such has no intrinsic power that the only power it possesses is delegated to it by the citizens of the country, and therefore is strictly limited, defined, and specified by a constitution, which authorizes the government to act as an agent of the citizens, not as a ruler, and only in specific issues outside of which the government has no power and may not act at all. In a state of society, the citizens may do only that which the government permits them to do while the government has unlimited freedom of action. 
In a constitutionalist society, the government may do only that which the constitution permits it to do, while the citizens have unlimited freedom of action within the sphere of their own individual rights. Only if and when any citizens attempt to violate the rights of others does the government take action against the violators in its proper capacity of protector of individual rights. Thus the Constitution, please note this, is not a document that limits the rights of man, but a document that limits the power of the government and of society over man. This, of course, was the political theory on which the United States of America was built, and this was the principle of the American Constitution. But the historical and philosophical paradox and tragedy involved was this. The political theory of America was based on a morality that did not yet exist, on a morality of life and of man's right to live which had never been formulated into a moral code nor explicitly accepted by anyone. It was an implicit morality. It was the code by which all honest and rational men had always lived in practice. And the founding fathers of America accepted it implicitly and based their political theory of individual rights upon it. But that which men do not know or accept explicitly and consciously is not in their full control. This is the reason why the United States of America embodies a fundamental conflict from the start. A conflict which has been undermining it throughout its history and which has now reached its climax. The conflict between America's political structure and the collectivist altruist morality. One is incompatible with the other. One or the other has to go. If America is to preserve and re-establish its freedom, it is the collectivist altruist morality that it has to reject. The United States, as I have said, is not a democracy but a republic. The difference between the two political forms is as follows. A democracy is a system of unlimited majority rule. A constitutional republic is a system in which the power of the government is limited by the inalienable rights of the individual and the government may make only such laws as do not violate these rights. The confusion of terms and definitions in political theory is worse perhaps than in any other science such that people use words with dozens of different meanings, no one making clear exactly what he is talking about. So it's very important that we be clear as to the exact meaning of terms. For example, when I call a free political system constitutionalism, I mean a system in which a constitution limits the power of the government. I do not mean a system in which some document is called a constitution but is not implemented, enforced, or observed. There is no relation to the actual political administration of a country and exists only as a showpiece to help the visiting evaders to evade some more. Such, for instance, as the scrap of paper called the Constitution of the Soviet Union. Today, most dictatorships and semi-dictatorships parade some such scrap of paper. But it's not formal tags or the corruption of language that we are concerned with, but factual reality. To be a constitution, a political document has to be implemented. The political institutions of the country have to be legally set up in such a manner that no part of the government can usurp power or take action contrary to the Constitution. All political systems in history have been mixtures of contradictory elements and contradictory labels. England, for instance, was closer to a constitutional republic than any other country of Europe. Yet formally, England is a monarchy and has no written constitution. Soviet Russia and Nazi Germany were called republics. So tags and labels will tell us nothing about the political reality of a country. The American Constitution came closer to creating a perfect political system than anything that has ever existed in history. But it was not without flaws and contradictions, and if you study the process by which collectivists gradually have been undermining it, you will see that they were able to crawl in through the cracks of such contradictions as the Constitution did possess, 
such as the eminent domain clause, the interstate commerce clause, or the phrase general welfare used where and as it is. The political theory of objectivism agrees in essence with the basic principles of the original constitution of the United States, omitting its contradictions. In a proper constitutional republic of limited government, the Constitution defines a basic code of objective moral and legal principles and sets up the structure of the government for its enforcement, leaving no legal possibility for any official or agency to usurp any form of constitutional power. Thus, the function of the government is that of political administrator or policeman, charged with the task of applying the principles of the Constitution to the specific issues and cases that come under its jurisdiction. The government formulates the laws necessary to translate these principles into practice. Please take note of the exact meaning of the word formulates. It means that the government may pass laws only for the practical application of constitutional principles but may not depart from these principles nor legislate at its arbitrary discretion. For instance, the right of property is an inalienable constitutional right. The concrete application of this right involves an enormous complexity of issues, including all issues of contracts, patents, copyrights, etc. The task of the government is to formulate the laws applicable to these issues which would protect the property rights of all those involved. What the government may not do is pass laws which would sacrifice the property rights of some men for the benefit of others, or laws which would violate all property rights. The basic definition of the proper functions of government are given by Ms. Rand in Galt's speech from which I quote, quote, the only proper purpose of a government is to protect man's rights, which means to protect him from physical violence. A proper government is only a policeman acting as an agency of man's self-defense and as such may resort to force only against those who start the use of force. The only proper functions of a government are the police to protect you from criminals, the army to protect you from foreign invaders, and the courts to protect your property and contracts from breach or fraud by others, to settle disputes by rational rules according to objective law." Unquote. All the complexities of political issues, of what is legally right or wrong, of what is a public or a private matter, of how to reconcile the rights of millions of individuals, which may appear to clash at times, are reducible to this single simple principle. The government may make no laws which initiate the use of physical force against anyone. No matter how complex any specific issue may appear, if this principle is held as an absolute, the proper legal solution can be found to achieve just, equitable, objective, rational legislation. But what proper government does not permit itself is a policy which amounts to, well, in case of difficulties, let's force somebody. That is not a solution. The purpose of a proper government is to eliminate the use of physical force among men by establishing a system of objective laws and to act as an objective judge in settling without violence the kind of disputes that can arise even among men of full rationality and virtue. It is precisely in order to avoid gang warfare that rational men delegate to a government the task of using force as retaliation against criminals. A government's use of force is subject to and restricted by severely specific rules. A government cannot seize, arrest, or condemn a man arbitrarily. It has to act in accordance with a strictly defined procedure. It has to abide by the laws of evidence, of proof, of defined punishments for defined crimes. A proper government is the agency by means of which the use of force is placed under objective law, under objective control, and is not left open to the whim of any individual who may wish to use it. Rational men lose nothing in delegating to a proper government the right to use force in retaliation 
and they gain the organized protection of an entire society to defend them against criminals. Now, in a society such as I have described, there is, of course, a complete separation of state and economics. That is to say, implicit in the political theory we have been discussing is the political-economic theory of laissez-faire capitalism. How does such a socio-economic system work in practice? That is the subject we will turn to in our next lecture. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, in the last lecture, I defined the fundamental nature of a proper political system, a system built on the inviolate supremacy of individual rights. Tonight I shall discuss the mechanics of the economic system that is the logical corollary of a political system of limited constitutional government. I shall discuss the economic system which has been mankind's greatest benefactor and which has been most reviled and denounced, capitalism. Economics is the science that studies the principles governing the exchange of material values and the production of material values in relation to exchange. Capitalism is the economic system based on the private ownership of the means of production. It is a system in which men freely produce and exchange goods and services. Unregulated and uncontrolled by any governmental, any coercive intervention. A fully consistent capitalism, a fully free society has never existed. But in the 19th century America, men came closer to it than in any other time or place in history. Today, few people really understand what capitalism is. Most of them, however, regard it as evil, old-fashioned, passé, which means that they regard freedom as evil, old-fashioned, passé. If one contrasts the standard of living and mode of existence of the average American that of the medieval serf, the difference is truly staggering. The medieval serf ate his meals off an earthen floor in a hut held together with mud. He worked 18 hours a day and lived in chronic terror of plagues and famines that periodically wiped out hundreds of thousands of lives. The richest and most powerful feudal lords lived in conditions that a modern American worker would regard as squalor. They had no bathrooms, they had no underwear, they shivered in winter windswept castles and died of epidemics now long forgotten, except in the history books of medicine. The simplest living amenities that we take for granted, soap, canned vegetables, radio, central heating, would have been regarded by them as unimaginable luxuries. What made this startling transformation in man's mode of existence possible? What was responsible for this incredible increase in wealth and standard of living of the lowest individual? What makes wealth possible? Which means, what makes life possible? Wealth, that is, physical goods, physical values, is a necessity of man's survival. Wealth is not simply paper money. It is not paper that feeds and clothes and shelters you. Wealth is material goods. Without material goods, without material values, man cannot exist. But wealth has to be produced. Wealth is created by transforming the materials of nature to serve human purposes. By transforming ore under the ground into the steel girders of apartment buildings. By transforming seed into a harvest. By transforming a waterfall into a source of electric power. 
All wealth is the product of man's mind and labor, a thought directing action. Wealth is not the product of instinct or muscles, it is the product of human intelligence. If man lived on a desert island, he would have to produce single-handedly all the goods he needed. He would have to work incredibly hard to scrape out the barest level of subsistence. He would have to do his own hunting and fishing, build his own shelter, and fashion his own clothes. But living and dealing with other men under a system of the division of labor and the exchange of goods and services, man's efforts are much more productive and yield to a much higher standard of living. Through specialization and exchange, men are able to raise their mutual productivity. That is, they are able to achieve many more values for the same amount of effort or for less effort. There are a number of reasons for this. First, by concentrated specialization upon a specific activity, men are able to achieve a much greater skill at their particular task than if they had to diversify their activities across a hundred different endeavors. For instance, if a man spends all his time making shoes, he will learn how to make them better and faster than if he had to divide his time among making shoes, growing food, building a shelter, and so forth. If he then trades with men who have specialized and therefore have gained higher proficiency in other tasks, his efforts and theirs bring them all a higher reward. Secondly, all men are not equally competent and able to perform all types of work. The division of labor makes it possible for men to do that which they can do best. Even if Hank Reardon, for example, could sweep floors more efficiently than the janitor in his factory, it would still be more advantageous to them both for Rear to delegate the task of floor sweeping to his janitor in order to have his full time for his industrial activities, which he can perform, but which are beyond the competence of his janitor. Third, different geographical areas do not contain identical productive possibilities. Some areas are suitable for mining, others are more suitable for agricultural development and so forth. It is clearly most productive for those different areas to be used in the manner for which they are best suited, and for the men in those different areas to exchange the results of their work with one another. Fourth, there are a great many activities and tasks that are beyond the power of a single isolated individual. One man alone cannot drill through a mountain, nor run a railroad, nor build a skyscraper. This is equally true for the creative mastery of the many sciences necessary for the maintenance of an industrial, technological civilization. Specialization and cooperation are indispensable for such achievements. But there is one fact that must not be forgotten. No matter how complex social and economic organization becomes, and no matter how specialized human activities, the basic nature, meaning, and purpose of productive work must always be remembered. That is, that a man works for himself. He works to maintain his own survival. This would be perfectly clear to everyone if each person worked alone on a desert island or a self-sustaining farm. It would not be assumed that the purpose of a man working on a desert island is to provide for the survival of some man living on another desert island. But this is what is forgotten or blanked out by too many people when they look at the complex economic interrelationships that exist among men in a trade society. It is assumed, in effect, that the purpose and duty of the man who specializes in manufacturing shoes is to provide the community with shoes. But this, and not his own survival and needs, is his goal. That service to the needs of the community is his primary moral obligation. Unfortunately, too many businessmen infected by the altruist morality have accepted this creed and have rushed to announce that they are only public servants that the goal and justification of their work is not the profits they make, but the employment they offer and the goods they distribute. 
Remember, therefore, that the motive of social organization and the division of labor is the self-interest of the individual persons who participate. In a free trade society, interests of men do not clash. All can profit from the exchange of goods and services. But social good, as apart from or against individual good, is not the purpose or justification of trade or of society. Now let us look at the operations involved in the free trade process itself. When men trade with one another on a free market, it is the law of supply and demand that determines the prices at which goods and services are bought or sold. When the supply of a commodity is greater than the demand for it, the price of the commodity falls. When the demand for a commodity is greater than the supply, the price of the commodity rises. Needless to say, in this context, people's demand for a commodity does not mean merely their desire for it. It means their desire plus their ability to pay for it. If two individuals engaged in a private trade, the price they agreed to would be set at the meeting point of their mutual self-interest. That is, the price would be set at that level where the seller considered it to his self-interest to part with the commodity in exchange for the money and the buyer considered it to his self-interest to part with the money in exchange for the commodity. It is the aggregate of many such individual choices that determines the prices in a market. The relationship of prices to supply and demand is reciprocal. At any given time, prices are determined by supply and demand, and in turn they subsequently affect supply and demand. If many people want a commodity that exists in comparatively limited quantity, the price of the commodity will rise, since people would be willing to pay more for it. But as the price rises, it becomes increasingly profitable to produce that commodity. The businessmen already producing it will have an economic incentive to expand their operations and produce more of it and the high profit margin will attract other businessmen to produce it. As a consequence, the supply will rise. When the relationship of supply to demand alters so that companies have to compete for a market in which demand is no longer in such excess of supply or in which demand is now less than supply, prices will be driven downward. If the demand for a commodity decreases, and prices and profitableness correspondingly fall, production of that commodity will be reduced. Businessmen will turn to invest their efforts elsewhere in fields where, relative risks considered, higher profit margins are possible. Their self-interest will impel them to produce commodities in more urgent demand, or for which they can anticipate a more urgent demand. Neither prices nor profits are determined by any individual's arbitrary whim. Capitalists do not raise prices because they are cruel and they do not lower prices because they are kind. If a capitalist places his price above the market level, he will lose customers to his competitors. If he persists in the policy, he will be forced out of business. If he places his prices below the market level and eliminates his own profit margin, again, he will be forced out of business. Across an entire society, the economic interrelationships among various industries and between the production of consumer goods and capital goods is extremely complex. But it is still the basic law of supply and demand that constitutes the heart and essence of the market mechanism. Just as the law of supply and demand determines all other prices, so it determines that category of prices which is called wages. Wages are the prices paid for human labor. A worker, selfishly and properly, does not want to work for less than his market value. An employer, selfishly and properly, does not want to pay him more than his 
market value. Most people regard the worker's desire as just. They regard the employer's desire as predatory greed. When labor unions demand that prices be lowered and wages be raised, they are demanding that everyone's prices be lowered except their own. Their self-interest, they declare, is not equal, but the employer is. Why has the employer no right to his self-interest? Why, because it is he who made their life as possible. This is the economics of the morality of altruism. Just as people do not condemn the worker who seeks the highest wages possible, so they do not condemn the consumer who seeks the lowest prices possible. They do not condemn a worker who shops among several possible employers in order to obtain the best wages and working conditions. They do not condemn a consumer who shops in several stores in order to obtain the best bargain. But let a businessman pursue the same course of self-interest. Let him shop among workers in order to obtain the best services at the lowest wage. Let him seek to get the best price for his goods, and he is denounced as vicious, as immoral, in effect as an enemy of society. I'm sure you have all heard such expressions as a fair wage, a just price, a reasonable profit. The implication of such statements is that economic values are intrinsic. That is, that in the eyes of God or of social planners, there is one inherently right price for every good or service, and any other price is wrong, unfair, and unjust. Such a view reflects a total ignorance of what economic values are. It's a perfect example of context dropping. Neither food, nor automobiles, nor human labor have any intrinsic value whatever. Their value can be determined only in the context of supply and demand. And just as supply and demand do not stand still, but alter according to varying circumstances, so there is a constant necessary readjustment of prices. For instance, at the present time, a loaf of bread costs roughly 25 to 30 cents, and that is the objective value of bread right now. Since the quantity of the demand for bread remains relatively constant, if the supply of bread were suddenly to increase, a loaf of bread might cost only 15 cents. And at that time, and under those conditions, that would be the objective value of a loaf of bread. If, due to adverse agricultural conditions, there were a sudden dearth of bread, the price might go up to a dollar, and a dollar would then be the objective value of a loaf of bread in that social context and condition. Who will say what is the intrinsic value of bread and by what standard will he presume to judge it? Economic value can be determined in one manner only, by the voluntary choices of all those who participate in the market, all those who buy and sell, work and employ, produce and consume. When social planners claim the right to decide what is a fair price, a just wage, or a reasonable profit, they arrogate to themselves the role of a dictator who imposes his wishes on others at the point of a gun. It is a gun that they regard as kind, all those who regard the free market as cruel. Profits are made possible only by the creation of wealth. That is, by so organizing the factors of production as to create a commodity that possesses greater value than that of the resources necessary to create it. To give a simplified example, when a steel manufacturer uses iron ore, limestone and coal to produce steel, he is creating wealth because the steel is worth more than the sum of the separate values of the iron ore, limestone and coal. Profits are the difference between a businessman's costs and the payment he receives for his goods. 
In a wider and deeper use of the term, wages may also be regarded as profits. The profit of the worker for the investment of his energy. Profits are not an artificial appendage of production. Profits in this wider sense, meaning income and production, are identical. An excellent statement of the relation between profit and production is given by Isabel Patterson in her book, The God of the Machine, from which I quote, quote Production is profit and profit is production. They are not merely related, they are the same thing. When a man plants potatoes, if he doesn't get back more than he put in, he has produced nothing. This would be obvious if he put a potato in the ground today and took out the same potato tomorrow. But it is all the same if he plants one potato and gets only one potato as a crop. His labor is wasted. Then he must starve or someone else must feed him if he has no reserve from previous production. The objection to profit is as if a bystander, observing the planter digging his crop, should say, you put in only one potato and you are taking out a dozen. You must have taken them away from someone else. Those extra potatoes cannot be yours by right." Unquote. Income, wealth, and production are identical phenomena viewed in three different respects. Wages and profits are the monetary equivalent of that which has been produced. They are a corollary of production and cannot fluctuate independently of it. It is only an increase in production that can make an increase in income, in profits and wages, possible. It is not the whim of labor leaders that make possible a rise in real wages just as it is not the whim of businessmen that makes possible a rise in profits. An increase in wages or profits depends on an increase in productivity. What does an increase in productivity depend on? Human intelligence. The discovery of how to make more products more efficiently, or the discovery of how to make new products. Profits are not achieved automatically, as no value can be achieved automatically. The fact that a businessman opens a factory, purchases raw materials, hires workers, and proceeds to manufacture some commodity does not guarantee that he will make a profit. It does not guarantee that he will be any more productive than the man who first plants and then digs out the same single potato. Profits depend upon successful economic calculation. That is, they depend upon the ability of the businessman to know what to produce, when to produce it, and how to produce it. If a businessman manufactures a commodity for which there is insufficient demand, he will not make a profit. He will have wasted his energy and his capital. He will have dissipated wealth rather than creating it. If he manufactures a commodity uneconomically and inefficiently, so that his costs are significantly higher than those of his competitors, and he cannot sell at their prices except by taking a loss, again he will not make a profit. The bankruptcy courts are filled with men who believe that it takes no intelligence to make money. At the center of economic activity in a capitalistic society stands the enterpriser, the entrepreneur, the man who assumes the responsibility of solving the enormously complex problems entailed in the manufacturing and marketing of a product. The man who invests capital and organizes the factors of production. If you want to understand how crucial is his role, you might picture a society from which he suddenly is gone. Let's say there are natural resources, there is a large potential working population either standing idle or functioning on the lowest levels of productivity. There are scientists and inventors perhaps making important discoveries and even designing new worthwhile products, but doing so in private, in isolation, with no practical use being made of their work. There are no factories, no manufacturing of commodities, no employment offered to the working population. 
Well now, if into the midst of this came a person who perceived the potential economic value of the scientists and the inventor's work, if he opened a factory, created jobs, and proceeded to manufacture the products which the scientists and inventors had devised, making these products available to the general public, one would think that such a man would be hailed as a hero and a benefactor. But when he does come, he is reviled instead and denounced as an exploiter, as a parasite, as a rubber baron. Who is that man? Well, of course, ladies and gentlemen, he is the entrepreneur, the innovator, the chance taker, the promoter, the financier, the industrialist. Why is he damned as an exploiter? Because he creates employment. Why is he damned as a parasite? Because he produces wealth. Why is he damned as a robber baron? Because he upholds his right to a higher reward than the janitor in his factory. Have you heard entrepreneurs and industrialists attacked for the vast fortunes they accumulate? Those fortunes are indispensable to the existence of an industrial civilization. Without large-scale capital accumulation, no long-term investments in factories and machinery and research and new inventions would be possible. The largest percentage of the capitalist profits are reinvested for the maintenance and expansion of his business. His profits are the lifeblood that keep the industrial organism living and growing. The small percentage he spends in personal consumption is virtually negligible against the context of an entire economy. If it were distributed among the general population, it would raise a single man's wealth by less than a dollar. Now this last is emphatically not said as an excuse for the capitalist profits. No excuse is necessary. It's merely said to point up the economic ignorance of those who cry against profits and do not appreciate what life-giving function they perform. The motive of the capitalist and of every moral man is his own self-interest. But observe that in a free society, the interests of men do not clash. In pursuing their own selfish goals, the men of ability bring benefit to all those with whom they deal. Henry Ford, for instance, did not go into the automobile business for the purpose of benefiting society. His motive was selfish. He saw the opportunity of making a profit. Because he discovered how to make automobiles more efficiently and more cheaply than they had been made before, and because there was a tremendous demand for automobiles, he made a fortune. The motive of those who bought his automobiles was not altruistic. Their purpose was not to help Henry Ford or to contribute to his fortune. It was to gain a selfish value, the automobile he had to offer them. Because the manufacture of automobiles became a highly profitable venture, other industrialists and investors were drawn into the field. Their motive, too, was selfish. They wanted to make money. Their goal was not to serve society. But as a result of their actions, the supply of automobiles was increased, competition became more intense, and prices were forced down, making it possible for consumers to purchase cars more cheaply than in the past. Incidentally, it was Ford who forced prices down when he grasped that it was more profitable to sell more cars at a lower price than fewer cars at a higher price. It was also Ford who instituted the $5 a day wage at a time when his competitors were paying 2 or $3 a day. Why did he do it? Because he grasped that higher wages would allow him to engage the best working force and to obtain the highest productivity from those he employed. His motive was selfish but he forced wages up in the whole industry. Why did the best workers come to him? Because they wanted to help him? Of course not. Because he offered them a better wage than they could obtain elsewhere. As profit opportunities in the automobile industry became less spectacular, industrialists, entrepreneurs, investors began to look elsewhere for new fields of endeavor, for more rewarding uses of their energy and wealth. Their motive was selfish, but what was the result? Nylon stockings, jet airplanes, wonder drugs, and television sets. 
Investment will necessarily be attracted to those businesses or industries that offer the highest returns compared to risk considered. A consequence of that will be an expanded supply of the particular goods in demand. The consequence of that will be an eventual leveling off of the profit margin. When the profit margin is no longer significantly higher than that of other comparable industries, investment will begin to flow elsewhere in the direction of still more rewarding opportunities. We have all heard the rewards of the investors announced as a so-called unearned income. Why should the investor who only puts up his money but does not actually work in the industry reap a profit, you have heard it asked. Remember first of all that the investor did not acquire the money he invests by picking it off a tree. He worked for it. It came from his own past productive activity. Secondly, to know in what to invest one's money is not self-evident, as a great many people can sadly testify. Intelligence and calculation are necessary in order to earn that so-called unearned income. And finally, it is those who invest their savings in new or growing industries who provide the material means necessary for productive expansion. It is the savings of investors that finance inventions, factories, and all the undertakings that keep a healthy economy moving to ever greater heights. Money is the blood of an industrial society. If those who provide it are not to be rewarded, then there can be no rational standard of reward and no industrial society. Now, you have heard it said that in a free market economy, rewards are achieved by competition. Let us consider the meaning of competition as it applies to economics. The competition involved in a free economy is merely freedom of achievement and freedom of choice. As producer or seller, every man is free to offer his goods or services to the whole country or the whole free trading world in exchange for the goods or services offered by others. As consumer or buyer, every man is free to choose the goods or services he wants to accept in exchange for his own. Thus, men compete for who is able to produce the best goods at the lowest cost. The competition is one of ability, of achievement, of values. If a man designs a better truck and sells it at a lower price than his competition, he gains the greatest number of customers. His competitors then have the choice of improving on his achievement or designing a still better truck, or if they are unable to do it, of changing to some other line of business. The motive and incentive ruling the activities of men on a free market is the basic motive of morality, to do better and still better and still better, to improve, to grow, to move forward. Now it is sometimes asked, how can one be sure that the best product will always win? Since men are not automatically rational, what if they choose inferior products? The answer is that the free market, like reality, is its own protection. If a person is mistaken or irrational in his choices, he suffers the consequences. For instance, if he buys a less efficient, more expensive truck, rather than a better and cheaper one which is available, he does not get the value, the service, or the performance that others get from their better trucks. His transportation costs are higher than those of his competitors. He is free to observe it, to correct his error, and to improve his judgment in the future. If he fails to do it, if he continues to spend his money irrationally, he suffers the economic consequences. The mechanism of a free market works to reward the men of rational judgment and to penalize the irrational, since the values involved are objective in that a better truck is in fact a better truck.
What is the alternative to the free market competition of productiveness? In effect, an economic czar or dictator who holds the power of deciding what men should produce and consume, what they should make, sell, and buy. A dictator who substitutes his judgment for the judgment of all the men involved in trading and decrees what is to be their good, what are to be their values. And as we know, there are a great many candidates, not only among politicians, but also among economists and other intellectuals for the role of just that kind of economic czar or dictator today. There are many contradictions in the socialists' attack on free market competition, and one or two are perhaps worthy of noting briefly in this context. On the one hand, they claim that the free market processes are too slow, and that a gun or a government edict would do things so much faster. On the other hand, they claim that the free market is too unstable, that it leaves men no security, that every job or business is constantly threatened by the innovators who can make them obsolete, who create mass unemployment and dislocate the economy. Both accusations cannot be true. Both, of course, are false. It is precisely because the free market processes take time that no innovation can dislocate an economy overnight. The processes of innovation and obsolescence are gradual, giving everyone involved time to adjust to the new trend. When the automobile replaced the horse carriage, it took decades before the last livery stable went out of business. The owners and the workers of any industry which is being replaced by a new industry have ample time to change to a new line of work and a new trade. Only in a controlled economy can a sudden, arbitrary, unforeseeable decree issued by some economic dictator's whim wipe out investments and throw masses of people out of work overnight. In fact, the security which the socialists are seeking is the security of arrested development, of stagnation. You have heard their complaints about the old worker who finds himself unemployed because the skill he had learned has become useless with the passing of the industry that employed him, or about the kindly old corner grocer who is thrown out of business by the big chain store. What the socialists seek is security for such a worker and such a storekeeper. Now let us consider what this means. It means that men somehow have to continue supporting a worker whose skill is no longer of any value to them. It means that the people who live in the neighborhood of the old corner grocer have to continue buying from him, even though a chain store could give them better service at lower prices, thus letting them save money. And money, after all, cannot be too plentiful in any neighborhood serviced by just one old store. It is precisely the poor, but the deserving, the hard-working poor, that any socialist scheme sacrifices to such stagnant persons. No man can expect the right to stagnate on a given level of development. A worker has to learn a new skill if he sees that the demand for his old one is vanishing. A corner grocer has to offer his customer some values that a chain store cannot offer or close his business and take a job with the chain store, or move to another neighborhood, or go into another kind of business. But no one has the right to expect or demand that the progress, the development, and the well-being of other people be arrested for his convenience on whatever level he happens to have reached. No one has the right to place a limit on the ability and achievements of others. Among the economic concepts that have served as tools for the destruction of a free society and the establishment of a so-called mixed economy 
has been the idea of separating production and distribution. The generally accepted bromide is that mankind has solved the problem of production but must now achieve a fairer distribution of goods and wealth. Identify what this means. If the distribution, that is the disposal of the goods produced, is not a right of the producers, it means that every man living is a slave whose labor and products do not belong to him but to others, to the state. It means that the state is the owner of all the goods produced and decides on how they are to be distributed. Whether he intends it or not, whether he realizes it consciously or not, any man who speaks of fairer distribution is uttering the basic principle of communism. If you have wondered why so-called conservatives are losing the battle for free enterprise, the reason is that too many of them accept the basic premises of their enemies and attempt to use them, which of course leads only to the further spread of collectivism. A good example of this would be the case of many so-called conservatives using the concept of so-called consumers' rights and invoking such alleged special breed of rights against labor unions in the case of strikes when they clamor for instance that the consumers have the right to milk or to shoes or to bus service or whatever the case might be and that the striking workers should be forced back to work by law this is an example of so-called defenders of free enterprise using a purely collectivist argument Nobody has a right to a product if those engaged in its production do not want to work. Workers have a right to strike if they are dissatisfied with the conditions of their employment. But they have no right to use force to prevent anyone else from taking their jobs if there are men willing to do it. In a free economy, no strike can succeed in paralyzing an entire field of production, certainly not for long, because no labor union holds a monopoly on an entire profession. In our next lecture, we will discuss the role of labor unions in a free society, and I will take up in detail a point I want to mention only briefly here. That is that like any other monopoly, today's labor unions were created by the government, in effect by legislation that forces men to belong to a union whether they want to or not and closes the field to non-union labor. Today, strikes can endanger the entire economy. Under a free system, they could not and did not. Under a free system, strikes, like every other economic issue, are settled by the law of supply and demand. If the claims of the strikers are unjustified, meaning if they ask for more than their services are worth on the market, the employer finds other men willing to work for the wages he offers and the strikers lose their jobs. If their claims are justified, the employer is unable to find other men to replace them and has to grant them their demands. The market is the only just, fair, objective arbiter of such issues. Now, turning to a somewhat different aspect of this subject. The essence of the theory of a mixed economy is that the government, without destroying the market altogether, as under socialism, can tamper with it when it so wishes, that is, override the judgments of the individuals who participate in the market and thus bring about a fairer distribution of wealth. A fairer distribution of whose wealth? In his epilogue to his very important work entitled Socialism, Ludwig von Mises discusses the theory of the mixed economy and shows why, if practiced consistently, it logically and inexorably must lead to a totally collectivized society. He gives a simple example. Suppose, he says, the government is dissatisfied with the price of milk. 
It feels that the price is too high and that there are poor people who cannot afford to buy it or cannot afford to buy as much of it as they need. The government therefore decides that in order to make milk available to more people, it will order the price to be lowered. What will be the result? The marginal producers of milk, that is, the producers whose profits and efficiency are so low that they barely are able to remain in this line of work, this line of production, the marginal producers will, in order to avoid losses, go out of the business of producing and selling milk. But then there will be less milk for the consumers and not more. If the government's aim was to increase the supply of milk, it achieved the opposite. Now, Mises goes on, the government faces the following alternative. Either it can give up the attempt to control prices or it can add a second measure to its first measure. It can fix the prices of the factors of production necessary for the production of milk. Thus, if the costs of the milk producers can also be forced down, that will make it possible for the marginal milk producers to remain in business. But then the same problem will repeat itself on a remoter plane. The government has again to fix the prices of the factors of production necessary for the production of those factors of production which are needed for the production of milk. Thus, the government has to go further and further fixing the prices of all the factors of production, both labor and material, and forcing every businessman and every worker to continue to work at these prices and wages. No branch of production can be omitted from this all-around fixing of prices and wages and this general order to continue production. If some branches of production were left free, the result, of course, would be a shifting of capital and labor to them and a corresponding fall of the supply of the goods whose prices the government had fixed. However, it is precisely these goods which the government considers as especially important for the satisfaction of the needs of the people. But when this state of all-around control of business is achieved, the market economy has been replaced by a system of planned economy, by socialism. This is the basic pattern I submit, of all attempts to interfere with the market. This is why controls breed controls. Since every act of intervention produces disastrous consequences, control is piled on control in order to head off those consequences. And the progressive strangulation of the economy is the result. In the whole history of mankind, there has never been a social economic system as just, as rational, as benevolent, as capitalist, nor as malign. And if men allow it to be destroyed, they will lose it without knowing what it was that they have lost. Let us take a brief look at the history of capitalism, at that system which has been accused of representing the law of the jungle. You all know the incredibly magnificent achievements of men's industrial development, of the so-called machine age. Incredible because in the brief span of a century and a half, man's life on earth was made happier, easier, safer than the sum of the progress of all the preceding centuries had done. This achievement is generally attributed to the invention of machines. This is true, but it's only part of the truth. What is not generally known is that machines had existed centuries earlier. A primitive kind of steam engine was designed in ancient Greece, and there is evidence to show that it had been known even earlier in Egypt. But these machines remained as mere curiosities or toys. They were not put to any practical use and did not lead to any further scientific development. Why? Because under the political systems of that time, when property rights did not exist, when any man's property could be confiscated and his life ended at the discretion of the political rulers of the moment, there was no rational incentive for anyone to devote his time and effort to material production or to science, particularly to technological science. Science and industrial production are long-range endeavors that require two conditions, freedom and property rights. 
freedom for man's mind to think, to act, to experiment, to venture, to produce property rights to protect the results of his effort. It was not until the 19th century that men acquired freedom, most particularly by the establishment of the United States of America. The result was the Industrial Revolution and the liberation of man's mind and the service of man's life on earth. The economic system that made it possible was capitalism, laissez-faire capitalism, a system that protected property rights and left men free to produce and to trade without government regulations or controls. I must add at once that this was the principle of the new system, but that in practice the principle was never permitted full realization. A system of pure, free, total capitalism has never as yet existed. It was fought from the start by entrenched collectivists of the feudal right and the socialist left. It was hampered by various degrees of government control and interference. Nevertheless, for a brief century and a half, men were comparatively, and in America predominantly, free. The tremendous industrial progress of the United States, incomparably greater than that of any other country in the world, has been ascribed by various historians to various causes. For instance, it is claimed that the United States owes its unparalleled progress to an abundance of natural resources. But other countries, such as Russia or Brazil, had an equal or greater amount of natural resources, which did not do them any good and did not lead to any such progress. It is claimed that the United States owes its success to the size of its geographical territory to a large area of land unbroken by the frontiers and boundaries of different nations which fact permitted the flow of trade on a large scale. But other countries had land areas as large or larger, Russia or China, for instance, and it did not lead to any remotely comparable progress. It is even claimed, incredibly, that the United States owes its success to the racial superiority of its people, and that some races are biologically determined to be more industrious than others. But the United States has no single racial stock. It is a melting pot of all races. Its industrial leaders came from among the immigrants of every kind of racial origin. And the racial brothers of these immigrants who stayed in the old countries did not achieve any unusual level of progress or success. What a few historians acknowledge, but most modern scholars struggle to ignore, forget, evade, or deny, is the fact that the one attribute which the United States possessed, which was not shared by any other country, was economic freedom, and that that was the cause of its unparalleled progress. If you look at the countries of Europe during the period when their economies were semi-capitalistic, that is, from the start of the 19th century to World War I, you will see the same correlation the degree of a country's industrial development and the height of its standard of living stood an inverse ratio to the degree of its government's control over its economy. The less government controls, the greater the progress of a country. The more controls, the smaller the progress, and the lower the general standard of living. England, which was the freest country of Europe, was second to the United States in its industrial development. You have all heard the accusations and the horror stories which the liberals spread about the starting years of capitalism. The small wages paid in the first factories, the long working hours, the child labor, etc. Well, as Miss Rand has remarked, capitalism did not create poverty, it inherited it. Capitalism came on the historical scene after centuries of so dreadful a poverty that modern men are unable to conceive it. In the pre-capitalistic era, the average life expectancy of a man was about 21 years. About 50% of the individuals born died in childhood. Mankind subsisted on a level of semi-starvation. Periodic famines swept over Europe every 20 years, killing off the surplus population which the pre-capitalist economies could not feed. Through all of these centuries, the size of the European population had remained approximately static, 
with a small increase of about 3% a century. Hunger kept it static. There were no means of survival to let it grow. During the 19th century, the century of capitalism, Europe's population grew by over 300%. If you knew nothing further, this fact alone would be sufficient to appreciate the essential truth about capitalism. If concern for the poor were the socialist motive, which it isn't, this fact alone would have turned them into champions of capitalism. For the first time in human history, capitalism made it possible for the masses of people to survive. The conditions of general poverty in the starting years of capitalism were harsh, but they were life, life made possible to people for the first time. The owners of the first factories didn't force anyone to work for them. If men and women and children left their farms and flocked to the cities to seek factory employment, it was because that employment was their only chance to live. If it were not for the factories, those children would have died of hunger or not have been born at all, because their potential parents would have starved by the age of 21. It was only the invention and the spread of machine production that raised the productivity of labor and made it possible to pay higher wages, to shorten working hours, to raise everybody's standard of living. In this country, the eight-hour day was established in most industries long before the New Deal and without the help of any labor unions. It was established not for any charitable humanitarian reasons on the part of the employers, but for their own self-interest. The higher productivity of labor created by the machines made labor more valuable on the market and increased the demand for it. Thus, contrary to the socialists, the interests of employers and workers did not clash but coincided. The income of both classes rose as the productivity of the economy rose. You will hear the socialists decry the fact that capitalism treats labor as a commodity but it is precisely this fact that had liberated all labor in the 19th century. Capitalism requires that employers compete for the services of workers and bid for labor on the open market. In the 19th century, slavery and serfdom were abolished everywhere in the civilized world, including even backward countries such as Russia. A slave economy cannot compete with a free industrial. In the United States, observe the difference of economic development in the free industrial north and the slave-owning south. And perhaps one of the most contemptible attitudes to observe among the enemies of capitalism is the attitude of some commentators who, in discussing the American Civil War, state disparagingly that the north deserves no credit for abolishing slavery in the south because they did not do it for selfish reasons they did it only because their economic self-interest under the capitalistic system demanded it. Pause on this for a moment. The alleged champions of the downtrodden discover the existence of an economic system which makes it impossible for any man's self-interest to be served by the enslavement of other men. And they, these champions, proceed to damn that system and struggle to destroy it. Do you need to know anything else about the nature of their motives? If you do, well, observe the return to slave labor since World War I, since the spread of collectivism in the world, the slave labor camps of Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia, which were not and are not mere penal colonies, but large-scale economic projects carried out by slave labor for the benefit of the state as part of the state's economic planning. Such was the nature of capitalism and such is the nature and mentality of those who, who are now attempting to destroy it. You will often hear the opponents of capitalism state that capitalism might have been useful or necessary in its time, but that mankind has outgrown it and it is now old-fashioned or impossible. Outgrown how? No answer. Impossible why? No answer. In the whole literature of the anti-capitalist school, no real reasons are given for these assertions. 
except such meaningless generalities as that the economy has grown too large or too complex. We will talk about these particular fallacies next week. But the essence of the issue is that freedom is essential to generate an industrial society, to create it, and it is no less essential to preserve it. And as I say, I will elaborate on that theme in the next lecture. If you want current, practical, journalistic proofs of this thesis, however, I will mention briefly the miraculous rebirth of West Germany following the Second World War under a comparatively free economic system, the disintegration of England under its socialistic controls, the performance of Castro, who, by nationalizing industry, destroyed the economy of Cuba within one year, and any other modern dictatorship or semi-dictatorship. As to the alleged industrial successes of Soviet Russia, I will say only, read Miss Wren's forward to We the Living. Check your sources of information about Russia's alleged success. And remember that after 50 years of communism, Russia is unable to feed her population and has to import wheat from semi-capitalist America. That is a fact and one well worth pondering. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, there are a great many misconceptions about capitalism, a tremendous amount of misinformation about capitalism, and certain questions which I am asked more often than any others by students of the subject who have absorbed many of the popular myths such as that capitalism leads to monopolies, capitalism leads to depressions, etc. and so forth. So next week, to round out our discussion of the nature and operation of a free economy, I'm going to devote the entire lecture to an analysis of some of the major myths and misconceptions concerning the nature and working of a free market economy. So we will continue right on from this point at our next lecture. Thank you.